Attention. This is the Dan Levitar Show. The inches we need are everywhere around us. With Stu Gatz and Hockman. Sorry. Attention. Yeah, talking sports. Look at me. On this team, we tear ourselves and everyone else around us to pieces for that inch. This is the real base. That's what living is. Attention. It's the guy who's willing to die who's going to win that itch. Yes! Attention. When we add up all those inches, that's going to make the difference between winning and losing. Between living and dying. Base is pumping. Hi, this is Al Pacino, and you're listening to my favorite sports talk show host, Dan Levitz. I don't know him. This is a fake liner they're making me do at gunpoint. The inches we need, Stugatz, are everywhere around us. Now, I can't make you do it. You got to look at the guy next to you. Look into his eyes. Not only do I know sports, but I know the future. Because that's what living is. It's the six inches in front of your face. Do I think coaching is important? Yes. Now, I think you're going to see a guy who will go that inch with you. You're going to see a guy who will sacrifice himself for this team because he knows when it comes down to it, you're going to do the same for him. This is the Dan Lebetard Show with Stu Gatz and Hockman on 790 The Ticket. This little segment made me real uh, giddy. In an effort to zig while others are zagging, I hate parades. (laughs) Always have. Oh, come on. Always have. Who hates a parade? Although it's got to be more fun to be in a parade, as Hawk and Stugatz were, than it is to be roadside in a parade. For many of you complaining today about the heat moving through that neighborhood the way a lot of people move through that neighborhood when they're a little scared that they moved through that neighborhood a little too fast. The reason for that was they were afraid of the rain, Mm -hmm. and they were afraid that last time they did this, a lot of people passed out in the heat because it was too hot. So I know some of you are complaining that the parade, you didn't get enough access to the champions, you didn't get enough time with them. They seem to have broken the speed limit moving those buses through that area. (laughs) I mean, it was a very fast parade. It was an unusually fast parade. It was scheduled for 90 minutes. We were out there for less than 60 minutes. So, yes, it went very fast. I mean, some of those buses, some of those floats could have been pulled over. For speeding. (laughs) But the reason for that was because you can't have rain. I mean, you can't ruin. The video footage cannot be a bunch of rain and people passing out from your celebration. This team gives people enough things to complain and criticize. Right. What was the funniest moment from today? Give it up, uh, because I really enjoyed the television coverage. I just really enjoyed. (laughs) One of my favorite moments is poor woman on Channel 10, an anchor. she, she, or a, you know, I guess she's a reporter, and she's like, uh, and and she hears a roar as a bus moves past, and she just screams, "There he is, the man of the moment!" But she didn't know who it was because it was Mike Miller, wasn't the black guy, so she was confused, and she's like, "There he is, the man of the moment!" No idea who it was. Really? None. <laughs> Come on. None. So the funniest moment from the parade, 786-360-0790 and the subsequent celebration. Now, I can tell you this, Dan, and I don't know if it means anything, but we had a conversation and... I said, uh, I said, I feel like Mike Miller has become one of the 15 most popular guys in Miami Heat history. The guy who was getting the loudest ovations today was Mike Miller, both inside the arena, both on the parade route, everywhere we went. I mean, Miller, 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 just loud roars for Mike Miller, and it was really cool to see. Really cool. Do we want to turn this into a race conversation today? Is it because he's hurt or because he's white? 
Well, it's because he hit seven threes in game five. Right. But Chalmers had a pretty big game he right did. before that, right? He right did. Be- right before that, he had a pretty big game. Chalmers didn't get any of that? Now, Rio got a lot of ovations, got a lot of love, especially inside but the arena. But not quite as much as the white guy. But not the Miller love. Not the Miller love. Not the Miller love. No one got the Miller love. We got a lot to talk about here today. Boy, I love Jason Jackson. But what a gas bag. He's interviewing LeBron, and he said more total words than LeBron during the interview because the questions were four times as long as LeBron's answers. <laughs> I mean, he enjoyed that microphone. Yeah, I didn't hear that. <laughs> you got to get in and you got to get out. People want to hear from LeBron. And, J- and Jason just, these long, I thought Jason wasn't going to keep asking questions to you know to start the next preseason. Uh, just these long, long questions. There, there was one point where I heard on my drive back where Jay Jax is interviewing Mario Chalmers speaking of Rio, and they're talking about how all the guys get on Mario. You know, LeBron, Wade, Bosch, and, that. and LeBron stood up and was making his way over to the mic, and Jay Jax told him to sit That's down. That's right. That parade was for Jay Jax today. <laughs> he said, Jay, you got to be careful with a microphone around that guy. <laughs> he said, LeBron, you sit down. It's Mario's time, which really means it's Jay Jax's time. He'll give you 400 words when only three are necessary. <laughs> and while we're at it, Fiorentino, enough with the life lessons while you're up there. I don't need to hear about the life lessons while you're up there. I want to just hear from the players. <laughs> you don't want a coaching lesson? Not really, no. Life lessons, you don't want any of that? I just want to hear from the players. The toughest gig was for Mike Inglis, the radio voice, because they oh. made him come up there. <laughs> I know. They, it was I know. sad. It was... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Eddie Curry has to feel self-conscious in that spot, of right? Of course. <laughs> There's nothing he could say that's not everyone snickering. Is that all Inglis got? Was they, he, was they, that all he got? They, you know, they were allowing all the heat voices <laughs> to interview some of the players at this ceremony. What did Inglis do to people that Mike, that's the gig? He got stuck Mike, with. Mike Inglis got Dexter Pittman, Oof. Terrell Harris, wow. yeah. and Eddie Curry yeah. to interview. And it was like, what do you say to them? Yes. Mm. Well, I mean, what do you say? Uh, you banged in practice. That's what he you said. Ma- <laughs> I mean, what, what can you say? That's all you can say. And what can Eddie Curry say? Like, it was, you know, it was like, and if my number gets called, I'm here for you. But like, Eddie well, Cur- never gets called. Uh, Eddie Curry has to feel self conscious. Was that like the second or third interview? I mean, you got these people, you know, DJ Reed gets everybody hyped up. You got the high, and then it's an Eddie Curry interview. I mean, I got to think people were there concessions there because did everyone go to a concession to the concession stand. Oh, yeah. that's when i got my lunch hot dog foot long but i mean how self-conscious do you have to be if you're eddie curry in that spot being interviewed and you got to know that nobody really wants to hear from you well it's just kind of silly like you're thanking all the heat players that had something to do with this glorious trophy we're looking at and eddie curry didn't have anything to do with it i'm sorry mike inglis you could tell me all you want that you need someone to practice against i'm saying eddie curry had nothing to do with the trophy number of people in that arena given that you know, everyone floods into the arena. I want a number from one of you guys who turned to the person next to them and said, who is that guy? I'm not even joking. I'm not joking because I got some of those questions. My brother today, my brother, who was at game five, texting the entire game, doesn't care about sports. And he was like putting a thumbs up when LeBron said he won it for him. My brother's like, thumbs up. Woo! You want it for me, and you know you're kicking Cleveland in the groin again and again. My brother was texting all game. <laughs> yeah, LeBron, you want it for me? My brother asked because he just started paying attention during the finals when they interviewed Joel Anthony. He asked me, "Who the hell's that guy?" Because <laughs> Joel Anthony didn't play a minute in the finals. No, he didn't. When they introduced Joel at the ceremony, he was walking up. Guys were kissing the trophy, touching the trophy. You heard a moan. You heard people in unison say, "Joel, don't drop the trophy." You heard it. Everyone was saying. I it. think a lot of people probably looked at. I mean, you're talking about fans getting to go into this uh, the arena that maybe don't normally get to go see a game, so they don't see all the video intros and whatnot. Yeah, I would say a good six, seven thousand people turned to their friends and said, "Who's that guy?" Are we getting LeBron? Are we get? Is LeBron coming on today? He's being interviewed by Oprah now. Yeah, it's possible. I, I've been told that there's the possibility of getting LeBron through his guy, but I mean, I would imagine. I mean, obviously the guy is in high demand, but when Oprah flies here to talk to you. You don't fly to see her. She flies to see you. 
you, you are big. Well, she's not what she used to be. Agreed. What? Yeah, Agreed. But she flew here, well, no, Dan. But she's Come not, on. She, she is not on national uh, television she's anymore. Oprah. She's got her own channel now, but not as many people are watching her as before. Oprah is always Oprah. There's nothing she can do to diminish her brand. I mean, she flew here for the king. Think about that for a second. Who the hell? She doesn't fly anywhere well, for, for anyone. For the three of them. For the three of them. And I think she's got a home on Fisher Island, or she used to anyway. So she's just getting a vacation out of the deal. Does it surprise you, by the way, that uh, so you have LeBron going on Letterman tomorrow? This is just perfect, at least for me. And you have Bosch going on live with Kelly Ripa. Why? That's pretty good, no? No, I, I think it's pretty good, but for me, that's just... For me, like, Kelly Ripa and that show, it's more for housewives. It's more for females, and I love that Bosch is going on that show. Well, Oprah... Oprah, is that? Nah, okay, good sound. Excellent old person uh, sound. I don't know. Uh, was Wade sober during... He wasn't sober during that ceremony, right? Oh, who cares? I mean, he's putting... No, no, what do you mean, who cares? Ah, oh, he can do whatever he wants. Well, I'm, I'm not criticizing him. I'm asking a question, because he kind of... He was loungy. He kind of had his elbow on the trophy... On the Larry O'Brien trophy, he's just sort of talking to the crowd, losing his place. Uh, coming up next, we're going to try and get LeBron here at some point. But coming up next, I I believe that Mark Hockman made uh, an egregious life error today, a parenting error today. And I will get your opinions on this next. This is the Dan Lebetard Show. My main man, Mr. T, right here, the first thing on the agenda says, never surrender. Never. Tell him, man. Tell him. The second thing says, even if your body says no, your spirit always will. Tell him. Tell him. They don't hear you. the last thing is... Whether you're busted from head to toe, uh huh. If you got one good hand left, yeah, brother, yeah. you climb in that steel Keep cage going. with Stu Guts and Hawkman. They don't hear you, Los Angeles. You better hear me. Uh huh. I'm coming home. I'm gonna get back at King Kong, buddy. Tell him. In the steel's cage that we're climbing in is gonna leave a lot of nasty scars on That's King right. Kong, buddy. That's right. On 790 the ticket. thing from the coverage today, funniest thing from the parade, funniest thing you saw, 786-360-0790. Give it up. I want to hear 786-360-0790. The single funniest thing from the parade and the celebration was blank. A texture writes in, wow, Dan, Oprah's not what she used to be. Mike Miller gets cheers because he's white. Nobody wants to hear from this player or that broadcaster. Really? Negativity today? I'm trying on a new character here. I am. I'm trying on a new character. <laughs> so we begin today with the question I believe everybody was asking at that parade. Who are they going to amnesty? <laughs> You like this character, Stu Guts? I love this character. You think I can keep it up? It's hard to find the negative things it is fun in a day like today. I mean, you are picking at a celebratory day here in South Florida. I just came from legion, seas of Heat fans. I mean, just hundreds of thousands of people. Everyone in a good mood. People were drinking at 9.30 this morning, double fisting, eating chicken tenders and french fries. And, oh, negative man. I have walked into negative man. Um, let me continue this, and let me question Hawk as a parent. Oh, boy. This is what I want to uh, talk about here, because Hawk and Stugatz were in the parade today. They were on a float. Mike Ryan was on the float with them. Uh, they were right near the Mike Miller float. Yep. And they had a great deal of fun, and I was insisting to Hawk yesterday, because Hawk's family was invited on the float with him, a, a really nice gesture by the Heat. Your family was invited as well, but your family is in New York this week, so it couldn't go. And I just don't understand, Hawk. Now, again, I am not a parent, so I don't know what it's like to have a child with you from 530 in the morning on. Hawk and Stugatz have been doing the morning show here as well as the afternoon show. So it would have been a very long day for your son, DJ. But to my way of thinking, Stugatz, mm -hmm. like that is a moment. I don't remember. what well, Your earliest childhood memories are what age? Uh, gosh, maybe uh, maybe eight, nine, ten. I don't remember very much, but Hawk's son is about that age. And what I was telling Hawk is, 
you got to get him on that float no matter what it takes if you've been invited on the float because he'll remember that for the remainder of his life being at the center of that. I don't uh, – I'm not sure I even disagree with you. However, and there's a big however here, if Hawk wanted to pull that off, if he wanted to pull that off, he could have done it, but he would have had to bring his son down to the American Airlines Arena. I'm guessing Hawk woke up around 4, left his house around 4.30. It would have been a very long day, but I think it would have been worth it. He's a well-behaved kid. Yeah, I know. But again, Dan, you have to bring your kid down there at 4.30 in the morning, then sit around while a four-hour morning show is going on, and then you bring him out to the parade, and then Hawk well, would have to bring nice him home today. Well, that's nice of you to answer the question, but Hawk's right there. Well, he's, he's right at the microphone. Here, I'm just saying, I think I would have done the same thing as here, Hawk did Here's the thing. Spot. It sounds great in theory, and I'm with you, to have my kid on the float and all this adulation. Every corner you turn, you know, there's just throngs of people that are just, I mean, they're undulating with with pleasure. And But Stugatz is right. I would have had to have woken my kid at 4.30 and had him leave the house with but my it's wife. it's worth it. Here was the thing. The, the Heat couldn't provide parking for my wife and kid unless they came down with me early. And it just wouldn't have been fair. We drive from Boca Raton. To get down there at 5.30 in the morning to the arena, he's going to be sleepy. And to sit there. And then we got on the back of the flatbed around 10.15. And then the flatbed didn't move till 11 o'clock. And it just would have been too long a day. He would have enjoyed a few moments on it, but it would not have been worth it and then just too long a day going to go back to the american airlines arena and waiting and, and essentially, i'm not a parent somebody help me here by text because what to me I'm, I'm listening to everything you're saying and and it just sounds like spoiled not to for me. an eight-year-old not for an eight-year-old just not worth it you would have gone to great lengths to... i offered to pick up his kid i offered to go to bulk and go pick up his kid because this is like a seismic thing now granted they'll be doing this every year for the next four or five years so right. there'll be other chances mm-hmm. but this would have been something that he would have remembered. Well, to your point, you're right. They probably will do it the next four or five years, but Hawk and I probably won't be invited to go back on the float the next four or That's five right. years. So, That's uh, right. Now that I'm thinking about it, I learned that my family was invited before they actually left to New York, and we had a serious discussion in our house as to whether we should postpone the trip a little bit, and I would bring my daughters down to the parade today. Uh, but th- my wife was so in New York City, get on the flight mode, and so they when, just got I don't understand what's happening around here. I don't understand. I honestly don't. This kind of moment, you don't get chances to be in a championship parade. Yeah. And and the both of you Mm -hmm. up and down blew it. The both of you. Just long day. Long day? Like what world is this kid living in? Long day. (laughs) It's a long day for a kid. That's right. And you'll remember it for the rest of your life, unlike whatever he did today. Which he won't remember. Well, he may have had a killer day today. You don't know. He, day he camp. will not I remember mean, whatever he did today. I think he went to day camp, played some hoops. I mean, you know, Hawk can show him the videos when he gets home. Uh, you know, I understand where I Hawk's just, coming I from. I can't. I cannot believe what you guys did i completely understand where you're coming from in thinking that until you take care of a seven-year-old then an eight-year-old you'll understand that there's certain things like there's times where they want to go to disney world and then you realize they have just as much fun at the hotel you're staying at yes than they do at hundred dollar a day disney world understood but give me your earliest childhood memory because your kid's a sports fan your yep. kid followed this team liked this team stayed up late watching games with you and this team you would have had not only your son in the middle of this great Miami moment, but on top of that, it would have been a take your son to work day. Yeah, too long a day, though. Too long a day. I work too long. You know what? You could have gotten the hotel down by the arena. There no, were things you could have done. Here. Here. You know, I, mean, I think in Hawks' defense, in both our defense, we didn't find out about it until... Uh, at no, least no, no. The- you guys blew it, and there is no defense. There's, oh, there's no a, excuse. There's, I, I wouldn't have changed it. Honestly, even when I after I went through the parade, I would not have changed anything. Your I, son deserves a better father. He, he I, I'm telling you, I gave him the day that he needed today. Like, he's going to come home. He's going to have a little bit of fun dip. He'll have yeah. some Swedish Do you realize fish. everyone in the audience, within the sound of my voice is saying, I wish I had that opportunity with my child. Not with everything that came along with it. Not with everything that That's came along difference. with it. You don't keep, a, you don't keep an eight year tell, no, from I'm telling, in I'm the telling everybody, I'm, I'm putting it out to every parent in the audience right now who's got a six, seven, eight, nine year old. And I'm saying, everything comes with it. You got to get up at five in the morning and your kid's got to spend morning. four in the morning. Four in the morning. Four in the morning ain't oh, five. Oh, butch up. Four in the morning ain't five. Butch up. Four in the morning, Dan. 
4.30 in the car, four hours. For a no, once-in-a-lifetime no. experience. Yeah, Dan, they... I bet your kid would get up at 4 in the morning if you told him he was going to Disney World. Yeah, but he'd sleep in the car. But to Hawk's point, you get to Disney World, Dan, and then 15 minutes later, they're like, oh, I'm tired, I'm hot, let's go you to the hotel pool. It. Well, it would be like driving him all that way to Disney World and then saying, here, sit outside the entrance to Disney World for four hours while Daddy talks to Stu Gatz. I'm a better parent than you guys are. <laughs> and Josh Friedman will watch you. <laughs> I am a better parent than the both of Here, you are. Talk to Tommy Tig for a couple hours, here's, and then uh, here's I'll your check on you at 8. Here's your babysitter, Zazlo. 786-360-0790. You can text us at 67974. We are endeavoring to get LeBron James. i got a million questions for that guy. I will try to ask them in a shorter way than Jason Jackson. <laughs> I mean, you're taking out everyone today. You are taking out Jay Jax. You're taking I'll out tell him right. You're taking I'll, out I'll tell him right to his face. Woo! You're and, taking out Fiorentino. And I'll be 80 years old by the time his response is done. Wanted to hear from LeBron today, not Jay Jax. <laughs> I'm telling you, we got to count words in that transcript. Jay Jax talking to LeBron. Who said more words in that interview, LeBron or Jay Jax? <laughs> Can we play it back? I'd like to hear it here. I don't want to hear it. I didn't want to hear it the first time. I just think it's funny. LeBron said 24 syllables, and Jay Jack said 1,024. <laughs> All right. Well, hopefully we'll have LeBron James on later today. We'll definitely have Mike Lowell on later today. This is the Dan Lebertard Show. I had an uncle, big gambler, right? Uh-huh. Uh, one night he's sleeping, and he sees a big number five in his dreams. Number five. Big, right? Okay. So he wakes up that morning and says, wow, I had a premonition. With Stu Gatz and Hawkman. Goes to the track, right? Takes the fifth bus to the track. When he's in the track, goes up to the fifth window. He bets $5 on number five. What happened? It worked. Horse came in fifth. On 790, the ticket. Well, it is my way it on the morning and I'm not doing our feet. It is my way it on the morning and I'm not doing our feet. It is my way. Okay, Lamborghini Mercy. Yo, chick, she's so Hawkins to God's not only bad parents, but also memory stealers. They are the stealers of memories, and texters and emailers pointing out that Stugatz's crime was even more egregious, because if you missed it during the last segment, both Hawk and Stugatz had the ability. They were offered, they were in a parade today, a championship Miami parade, a day of partying and celebration, as if Miami needs an excuse to party. And their families were invited. And just to recap, Hawk did not bring his son because it would be a long day. And Stugat, his family left to New York. But here's the funnier part of that. This escaped my attention until it was pointed out to me during the break. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I reminded you. Stugat, his children are going to sleepaway camp. Yep. Today was the last day, last chance he had to see them for two months. Yeah, they're going tomorrow. He sent them to New York. And stayed to enjoy the parade himself. I chose confetti. Over his children. Yep. Now I'm flying out of here. I'm actually leaving the show a little bit early today. And I'm flying out of here. And I'm getting my ass to New York. And thank you to my wife and my kids for allowing me to stay here to experience this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And I will drive my kids to the buses tomorrow. But I don't feel good about my decision at all. And as confetti was raining down no, you on felt me, good about it then. I felt great about it then. The second I walked off that float. Right, now you don't feel great oh, about I it. Oh, I felt terrible right. about it. You're, you're a, a good, self-absorbed fan. Uh, as a father, you stink. <laughs> I, uh, I have never been more secure with my decision as I am right now. But I will tell you this, and Dan is sounding like the most selfless father or father-to-be at some point in his life than ever. Here's Dan's parenting skills. i just tell you a quick story here. When my son was first born, <laughs> and he was about six, month, six months old a in a carriage, story. it's, it's a in a carriage, yeah. we go to Thanksgiving dinner. 
at Levitard's house. And there's, you know, 30, 40 people at this place. Now, our son is six months old. He is sleeping in a carriage. My wife first and I. First time child. First, first time child. You know, we've never been parents before. And we're just getting, you know, this is one of the, the first times out into a big public gathering. And it's about uh, maybe 9, 10 at night. And my wife and I are ready to leave Thanksgiving dinner at Dan's house. And... We are now looking for our son. We're saying goodbye to people. We're saying goodbye to Dan's mom, his brother, the people that are there. And now we're looking. Where is the carriage with uh, or stroller? I guess that they call it in the in, in the. Your uh, first 2000s. mistake, incidentally, your first mistake is that you uh, lost that, track of him. Yes, that somehow sure, somehow your child understood. and the stroller were gone, and you don't know where they are. Understood. But there were a lot of loving people around there, Stu. Guts. This yeah. is not like a toga party. It was sure. a Thanksgiving dinner. Right. I got you. So now we're looking around. Where is our son in the stroller? Do you know this story, Stu Gatt? No, I do not know Dan, this. So Dan, in all his parenting prowess, has decided to play a joke on my wife and I by putting our son, the six-month-old, in his stroller in the middle of the street. Yes. It's completely dark out. Yes. Now, we exit Dan's house. The, the look on my side of the studio here is utter shock, and I wish I was joking. It's not a joke, but wait, but there are qualifiers. There I'll let hot keep going, is though. No lights on the street, mm-hmm. okay? Yeah. It is 10 at night. Dark. Pitch black. Dark. There is just a stroller uh-huh. in the middle of the street mm-hmm. and nothing else. That's correct. And we run out to get, obviously, our son and stroll him out of the street. And Dan is there behind a parked car laughing. Yeah, oh, I'm four feet away. I'm four look feet away. Look what I did with your son. I had him out here. And then when you walked out of the house, he was in the middle of the street. Gotta toughen that kid up. Mind you, anyone could have flown around the corner <laughs> yes. at any time. Now, Dan maintains to this day he was wait, close wait. enough to the stroller Hawk, to stop hold it. Hold on. Hawk. He was not. Hawk, I he was, was not. Listen to this. And he, we were angry at Dan, Dan was for his doing son this. In jeopardy or not. To this day, this is so eight ridiculous. years later, to this day, he still thinks it was a funny joke. It is funny. And here are the <laughs> qualifiers. Funny about no, it. Here are the qualifiers that make it funny because he's painting a different pish, a different visual here. Okay. First of all, it's a cul-de-sac. Okay, so nobody's flying around any corners. It is not a cul-de-sac. It, nobody's flying. Nobody's ever gone past my house at more than 15 miles an hour. There are no intersections anywhere near my house. My house is in the middle, so there, there's no car going to emerge. Maybe a flying saucer or a jet could have crashed in the stroller. And furthermore, I was four feet from the child hiding behind a car. I would have seen Dan if he was four feet from the child. Secondly, I was hiding. Manny Ramirez and his family live in that neighborhood, so you can only imagine how fast cars are flying by <laughs> down those side streets. <laughs> that is wrong you on so many levels, You don't take a baby man. and put him in a stroller and put him in the middle of the street as a joke anytime, You don't lose anywhere. your baby. You don't lose your baby at a Thanksgiving party. It's your fault. <laughs> Dan, I mean, you left the poor six-month-old out there in a stroller. That is correct. The streets. That is correct. I was right near him. I mean, you realize a car is coming like 30, 60, 30, 70 30. miles further. I don't care how my, close my you are. My guess is, that I'm, what I'm telling you about this street, Stugatz, is my guess that is on the average day, 24 hours, five cars drive by my house. Like, Hawk is painting the picture of it's a highway. Well, I don't like, think anyone thinks it's a highway. No, I, we understand. No, on the you... average day, I'm guessing five cars go by my ho- go in front of my house. Well, what would have happened if just God forbid, you know, one of the five cars came yeah, that by would, right well, then? That would have been bad. And I'm guessing it probably would have ended my friendship. <laughs> I'm guessing. I would have been at a funeral for a dead baby. <laughs> no, you don't that, get invited to the funeral afterwards. Well, I would have crashed it, and you know, with a lot of guilt. Jason, you're on 790. There are invites to a funeral. <laughs> Dan, you could not be more right about anything you have said in your entire life. They blew it. They had the chance of a lifetime. I have a five-year-old who would have practically killed one of them to get on that float today. And he would have done just fine. That The eight-year-old would have done fine. He would have played around in the arena, maybe pass out on a chair, catch a little nap, and then have the time of his life long and the day. memory of a lifetime. Long, long day, long day. Hey, do me a favor. Leave me out of this. First off, I have girls. They don't love basketball nearly the way Hawks boy does. He built a basketball court in their backyard, and they had to go up to New York for camp. I, and it would have cost me thousands of I, dollars to change I, the flights. I don't, think, Stu, I don't think Hawk realizes how entitled he sounds when he just says, well, the Heat wouldn't give me parking. You know, they, they, they put us on a float. 
Well, I mean, I understand where he's coming yeah, from. Right, yeah, right. Because, yeah, they didn't do enough were. for us. Then. Right. And you two are the guys who say that those Heat players are entitled. <laughs> Jay, you're on 790, the ticket, Jay. Dan, I got to be honest. Until I heard that story, I was thinking, boy, Dan, you could be a parent. That's you know, right. Like the kids. Right. That story is pretty awful. I got to be honest. Yeah. You know, just having kids, brother. But uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Hawk. What are you doing? I, I, when I was seven years old, my first memory was going to the Gulf of the Bears Monday night football game. See how fake I am that I have that memory? They would have survived. I have a, a, a kid my own, myself. He's five years old. He would have, like the previous caller said, he would have killed to have been on that float. And I guarantee you, I'll bet this is going to be in Dan's next rants, which are, by the way, the funniest thing. I had to pull over the other day listening to Dan's rant on the championship. I had to pull over the highway. I just was laughing, belly laughing so hard. I just wanted to thank you guys. You guys are doing an amazing job at Hawk. You blew, you blew it. Sorry, buddy. Hawk, you know what? Now that I'm thinking about it, I'm not sure you didn't blow it. I mean, you did blow it. Oh, not at all. I've never been more confident. Honestly, it was it was so long a day, even for me, uh, between 6 and 10, I was getting bored. I was doing a radio show. There's also people suggesting that I press charges against you, and now I'm thinking about it. Well, text writes in, I think it's funny, but you have to act angry in front of your wife. And someone else is pointing out that you're just trying to deflect criticism from your horrible decision by pointing out something that happened 10 Thanksgivings ago. No, he's standing on high as the guy who knows parenting and good parenting, and I was I giving prepped- you... I was giving you an example, a rebuttal, if you will, that perhaps this is not the guy you should be listening to parenting I advice prefaced, from. I prefaced it with saying I am not a parent. Let's do it this way, Hawk. Imagine you were a big Bulls fan, Bears fan growing up. Imagine that uh, that your dad had the opportunity to take you on a championship float for the Bulls, for the Bears, and he didn't. Ta- he passed up on that opportunity. Would you not? Uh, would you not forever be uh, a little upset with your dad for that? Well, you're not. You're not complaining. You're not uh, painting the complete picture. You had an opportunity to be on a parade today. Yes, you had and an I, opportunity and I took to take advantage your, of that you, opportunity. You had an opportunity to take your son on that. Correct. I also had an opportunity to wake my son at 4 a.m. during the summer. I chose not to. I had an opportunity to make my son sit for four hours. In, I mean, that guy suggests he plays in the American Airlines arena. I don't know exactly where he would play there. But pointing out that I would be a, pa- a bad parent does not make you any less of a bad parent. No, it, it shows you that my judgment may not be as flawed as the guy who is correcting my judgment. I mean, you had a kid in a stroller in the middle of the street. And it was funny. At night. And it was funny. <laughs> on a night where people are drinking. Cul-de-sac. Partying. <laughs> cul-de-sac. It's not a cul-de-sac. Stugatz, you've been to Dan's house. I know, house. it's not a cul-de-sac. It is not a cul-de-sac. I mean, talk about massaging the facts for your own story. Dan, there's like a straightaway before you get to the cul-de-sac. You're not in a cul-de-sac. You're near a cul-de-sac, but you're not Stugatz, in the actual nobody cul-de-sac. nobody has ever driven past my house at more than 13 miles an hour. No, that nobody, and I was four feet from the child, and I will testify to how funny it was in front of child services. Because it was funny. I'm pressing charges. It's a great practical joke. What if there was a scenario there that night where it was you or the kid? Like, that was the only choice. It was you or the kid. Think about, don't make it so dramatic. It's a cul-de-sac, it's 13 miles an hour, and five cars go by there every day. You or the Just, kid? I want you to, look. You, this is why I tell you that it's funny, okay? I understand that it's not funny for Hawk. I understand. It's his child in a stroller in the street. But now, radio audience and everyone here in the studio, put yourself next to me and look at Hawk's face when he comes out of that house and there's a stroller in the street. Most with people his are placing you under citizen's arrest if funny they're next to you. Funny or not funny. I know it's not funny to Hawk. It wasn't meant to be funny for Hawk. Funny or not funny, Stugatz, if you've been right next to me and seen Hawk's face of horror. <laughs> not funny. <laughs> Dan, if I pull out of your driveway, I can go left or right, <laughs> and I can get back out to the exit. That's not a cul-de-sac. <laughs> and what is a face of horror? Funny. When it's your friend. That's how. Pra- that's oh. when practical jokes are great. Oh, you and your cul-de-sac. I, mean, Hawk, I don't think there's a cul-de-sac in his entire neighborhood. Not one. Anywhere. This is the Dan Lebetard Show. Pills? You mean you really are taking drugs? I need them. Jesse, give me those. I need them back. I have to sing. Jesse, you can't sing tonight. Yes, I can. With Stu Gutz and Hawkman. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. On 790 The Ticket. Would have been hard.
hard to live with myself if something had happened to DJ. Hawk, do you think you would have pressed charges? If D- Dan, are you serious? Do you think Hawk would have pressed charges? I mean, clearly it would have been a mistake, Stugatz. Let's let's take this out to the logical example. You would have pressed charges? I mean, like, obviously it's horrific. Obviously it's an error, but it wouldn't have been intentional. It wouldn't have been me. Like, I would end up in jail for a very long time if something bad had happened to that baby. You'd press charges? My kid is dead. You're going Under, to prison? Under, understood. Wow. Okay. Well, I, I don't think it would be up to me to press charges. The state would file charges. It's not up to the person to press charges. Uh, the funnier way probably to do the joke was to put the stroller out there and then hold DJ with you wherever you were hiding. More dangerous my way, though. You see, I couldn't <laughs> see you. whether DJ was in the stroller or not. I just saw the stroller <laughs> lit by the moon in the middle of the street. That joke was would have been... I, I would have had the same reaction whether he was in there or not. I don't even remember. Did I not... I didn't have the baby in my own hands. I might have had the baby in my own hands. If you I... had him in the stroller holding your cigar. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Hawk. Now take this out to Dan's extreme here. If you had the ability, to forget about the state. In if the you could press charges. I don't think he presses charges. I mean, obviously a you feel horrible. runs over your newborn and no, you're pressing under, charges. Under, like, under, understood that it's unbelievably stupid and it's catastrophic. But what, and you, and you what? You want to punish one of your friends with jail time for that? Like, obviously, it ruins the friendship. You'd press charges, would you? I don't know. I, I mean, it's I don't know. One. No, if it's if it's an option, let's say it's an option, and let's make the hypothetical. Let's get a, around the illegality of it or the legalities of it, and let's just make it simply: the choice is yours whether or not I get jail time in that situation. The choice is yours, not the state. Can I choose the amount of jail time? I mean, some sort of punitive punishment, like something. Can I choose? I mean, I'm not going to buy you cake. Like, I'm not going to buy you a present. I don't know if I'm going to press charges. Well, it probably ruins the friendship. Well, I mean, of course it's, it ruins it's, the it's friendship. a hard thing you to forgive. You wouldn't want to be around me. It's, it's a hard thing to forgive. But why would you But why would you press charges? Like, clearly it's a mistake and an act of unbelievable stupidity. Because you played a practical joke that resulted in the death of my really? child. Okay. All right. Well, now I know where you stand. Okay. Like, I would never do that. I would never do that to somebody who was a friend of mine, even understanding that it's that the pain is forever and it's the worst pain you could inflict on somebody. But clearly it would have been a mistake. See, again, folks, th- again, folks, just listen to everything that Dan is saying. And then remember, he's telling me I was a bad parent today. You were a bad parent today. You <laughs> robbed your child of a memory that all, you really I could have prevented it many years ago by going to jail for killing your child. You're, I could have prevented you from being a bad parent today. Your family is a really tight family, a really close family. Don't you think if if Gonzo or your mom's best friend played a similar practical joke when you were six months old and it resulted in your death don't you think they would wish or don't no. you think if they could no. press Sugas, charges we, Sugas, we've talked about this before in terms of whenever we're talking whenever we're watching sean taylor's dad give a press conference and there's a serenity or a tranquility of his born of forgiveness what does it buy you to have me in jail does it make you feel any better like uh, honestly does it no. bring back your child like all it is is an act of vengeance and an unforgiving act uh like the 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 most spiritual and happiest people I know are people who can arrive at forgiveness over things that seem unforgivable. Th- those those are the people walking around in life with a tran- with tranquility and a serenity um, that that I admire. I'm guessing. Well, is there a uh, because I'm a big believer in eye for an eye. Is there some sort of like horrific practical joke that Hawk and I could have played on you? As it, payback? It's gods, it would be horrible. I'm not saying it wouldn't be horrible. And I'm not saying that you would find a place to forgive it. I'm going the next step and saying, would you actively want it punished beyond the horrific guilt I'd be carrying around of having ended the life of Hawk's only child? Like and and your answer is yes. I'd want to punish beyond that. And to me, like I mean, the hypothetical isn't disturbing because of what we're talking about. As ridiculous as it is, what we're talking about to me, it's disturbing that you would want me penalized beyond what I'd already be carrying around because of a horrific thing that I did. Yeah, no, I'm starting to come around. I'm starting to think about it. Knee jerk is yeah, I want I want to inflict a lot of pain on you. It depends really, I guess, on how you're going to live the rest of your life. Like if you did that to my child. And then years later, I see you yucking it up on PTI with Michael and uh, Tony having the time of your life. Or then you're doing the show with your dad, which is a constant memory of me not having my child. Yeah, I don't <laughs> know. I don't not, know how it would react. All right. There. And people are writing in, you just murdered the child. And what I'm saying is, no, I didn't murder. Like, it's an 
accident. I understand if you want me sent to jail because I stuck a knife in your child's heart. I'd be okay if they publicly stoned you in the middle of the American Airlines arena during today's celebration. Rick, you're on 790 The Ticket, Rick. Hey, uh, Mark, I think he was right on not taking your child because hypothetically it could have poured down rain today and it could have been one of the sorriest days of his life. And for an eight-year-old, they get bored really quick. I got twins of them, so I know how they can get. I, they weren't at the parade neither. They had their uncles there. They weren't there. I had to work. But I understand where you were coming from, Dan. Everything comes to anybody at, at, when it's their time, and there's a reason you ain't got kids yet, man, because if you have to deal with some eight-year-olds, you know not to take them to work, and that's a day especially. Dan, you're on 790. Yeah, hypothetically, that last caller was a moron. Hawk. Huh? You blew it so bad. Let me tell you how bad you blew it. Normally we would call that a Lewinsky. But if you did something like that, you'd have to call it a hawk. <laughs> you, it would be like, it would be like, it would be like, hey, baby, baby, hawk me tonight, honey. Honey, I want some hawk. You would be the new Lewinsky if you didn't take your kid to that parade. You got to be. The LeBron's first. Are you kidding me? As Stephen A. would say, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I, I got to be honest with you. I wouldn't mind if that becomes a verb. Brian, you're on 790. <laughs> yeah, Hawk, you blew it, man. One of the fondest memories that I've ever had uh, growing up in the 80s was going with my late father now uh, to the national championship uh, parade for the Hurricanes. And that's something that I'll never forget. If the guarantee or guarantee nothing was going to happen to your son on that prank, you might as well just let him do it. For now, you might as well let him babysit your kid because you know what? You blew it so bad, bro. Well, I wasn't worried that anything was going to happen to him. I was worried I about just, him being bored. Yeah. I mean, who wants to, what, what kid wants to sit around for four hours waiting for a parade, then the parade, you know? I mean, it's not like a, not like he's on the Disneyland float. I mean, we're on a flatbed truck, for crying out loud. 786-360-0790. We are endeavoring to bring you LeBron James at some point before the end of the show. Mike Tyson is going to be appearing on Pardon the Interruption, and apparently the interview, as you might expect, is totally, totally crazy mike tyson on pardon the interruption today at 5 30 we are trying to get lebron james we will see if we do some some point before seven o'clock this is the dan lebitard show i am an fbi agent with stugatz and hockman you... i am an fbi agent on 790 the ticket i am an fbi agent How confident are you in us getting LeBron James? What is your confidence level on this? Because the Heat have told us that they're trying to get him for us, but there's a lot of stuff going on today, and Oprah's interviewing him, and the media is tugging at these guys, and they haven't been sober for four days. I feel like 60-40 against. Against? Why? Well, he's doing Letterman this week. He's doing Oprah this week. He was just subjected to the uh, the Jason Jackson interview with the American <laughs> Airlines Arena. Like, he's got he's got a lot of stuff he, going on. He's worn out, right? He, I mean, it was the Jason Jackson interview that wore him out. Like, more than... <laughs> Even Letterman, go, Letterman at this point is nervous about more, getting more LeBron. More than 45 <laughs> minutes uh, every playoff game. More than cramping. It's just, he got really tired during the Jason Jackson. Jackson interview. Canceled Oprah. <laughs> he did. Uh, he did Rachel Nichols this weekend. The, you know, an interview. An interview. An he interview did an with interview with Rachel, Rachel Nichols. Nichols this weekend. <laughs> He's been um, everywhere. He, he really has been everywhere. So I don't know where you fall. You've created some sort of relationship with LeBron this season, no? Uh, not really. I mean, I, if he sees you, if he sees you, he would say, "Hey, Dan." I don't know that to be so. I mean, I've talked to him a couple of times, but I have no idea if he knows who I am or if I'm just another uh, faceless person bothering him with questions. I was watching uh, Mike Miller on one of the floats today, and I couldn't help but think back the story you told on Friday about the moment that you and Mike Miller shared after the Heat Championship. Uh, it was kind of, I mean, I'm looking at him, and, and even on the float, he looked broken. I mean, it was tough well, he for couldn't him. Sit, he, was, he was sitting next to Shane Battier being interviewed on the stage. He couldn't sit on that seat. Like, Shane Battier is perfectly proper and erect, and his posture is perfect. And 
And Miller is like slipping off of the chair while he's being interviewed, kind of sideways because he's in pain just sitting down. Even when he was standing, he had to kind of have like his el- he was leaning on his elbow, like his you know side of his face was in his hand on the side of the uh, on the side of the float there. But he seemed to be having the time of his life. His kid was with him. There was confetti all over Miller, and he was getting the loudest. I'm telling you, getting the loudest of agents of anyone out there. Today. Well, I mean, crazy. of course he's having the time of his life. The guy just won an NBA championship. But I just found it funny when I was looking at him. You know, Dan had mentioned. After the championship, they had an embrace. They shared an embrace in the locker well, room. Well, can it be an embrace if only one person is doing the hugging and well, the other one? Well, that's the weird thing. So Mike Miller is <laughs> embracing you, and you were kind of aloof? I kind of was not aloof. Not, a, not aloof. I like Mike Miller. I don't know Mike Miller, but I like – it's just I'm a journalist, and I'm not supposed to be – it's the reason that I wasn't on the parade float with you guys today. <laughs> like, that seems like it would have been fun, but I can't be on a parade float wearing a cheerleading outfit. You know what I was I was thinking about that today because uh, the one thing that was missing was you. You should have been there. It was me. It was Hawk. It was Mike but, Ryan. But I, I can't Roy do been those there. things. Yeah, but you know what? You're the guy who delivers these rants, and I feel like you could have went tongue and oh, cheek. The rants on. are tongue and cheek. I'm making fun of Miami as much as I'm making Man. fun of anybody else. We should join. Us I on the can't float believe today. that you can't share a true embrace with Mike Miller, though. I mean, the guy's been through a lot. Whether you're a journalist or not. Well, and I was stiff. That's the thing. Is it an embrace if only one person is doing the embracing and the other one's just sort of shoulder first, stiff and and not knowing exactly what to do. Have you thought about that moment, though, over the weekend at all? Like, have you replayed it in your head about what happened with you and Mike <laughs> Miller in the locker room after they won an NBA championship? Like, hey, if you had the chance to do it over, Dan, would you do anything differently? No. no. Well, I would have I, I would have been more prepared for it and not been quite as caught in the middle of the embrace. Because he was really sweaty. Yeah. And he was really happy, too. And he was hugging everybody. Like, this was not exclusive to me. Mm-hmm. He and, and probably my journalistic sensibilities there were were probably a little a little <laughs> skewed. They skewed. I should have just hugged the man because he was he was really happy. Because I know what happens with me. Like, yeah, I think back to when I was in college and I know that I had a moment. I'm not suggesting it was sexual, but like I had a potential moment with a female and I blew it. Like I'm thinking about it and I'm like, wow, the way this played out. And I'm just wondering if you kind of went over in your head about you were having this moment with Mike Miller. Maybe it would be a moment that you would re- remember forever. Maybe it's a moment where you and Mike Miller become best friends, <laughs> but you allowed your journalism credentials to get in the way and just ruin this genuine moment. Mike Miller was looking. Looking for someone. Oh, but keep in mind, Hawk, I, I mean, like I did some damage to my legitimate friendship with Ricky Williams because being a journalist, it matters to me. Like it, it, it I'm not a cheerleader. Uh, I understand like that's that, a, but... that. Like I did legitimate damage to a, to a friendship there and to a, to a friend, um, so, and I don't even know Mike Miller. <laughs> well, that's the part that I'm wondering if you played it out in your head over and over again, because you don't know him very well, and he made a beeline for you. Uh, yeah, I think you kind of blew it there, Dan. And I'm fascinated by Hawk's earlier question. If you walk past Mike Miller right now, would he know your name? Would he say, hey, Dan? Yes. Dwayne Wade? Yes. Chris Bosh? Why are we doing this? Well, do because I am be, fascinated do you, do you, by it. Because LeBron James said hi to me today. He said, hey, Stu Gouts, what's going on? Do you think it would be awkward he didn't? Do you think it would be awkward? <laughs> Damn, Huck. Do you think it would be awkward if you ran into Mike Miller somewhere? Do you think he feels like you kind of dissed him no. at the celebration? No, no, because we were laughing. Once he let me out of his embrace, we were laughing, telling <laughs> telling stories. We've been uh, we've been notified that Eric Spolstra is going to join us in a couple of minutes. All right. We will talk to Eric Spolstra next. Uh, I want to ask you guys this. Mike Tyson is going to be on Pardon the interruption today. And the PTI guys are floored by what this interview became. And I'm just wondering, given that Mike Tyson told you he impregnated a guard while he was in jail, Mm -hmm. given that Mike Tyson has said in the past that he's a prostitute hunter, Mm -hmm. given that Mike Tyson has talked about crimes that he has committed as a bully, what could Mike Tyson possibly say at this point that would actually be explosive? Give me the thing that's going to be said on Pardon the Interruption today, given how honest this guy has been about all his weaknesses, all his frailties, about about suicide. Think, like, what could he possibly say? Give me the example. Did it get cantankerous or he just said something that was I don't know the details yet. I don't know the details yet. I'm asking. But apparently the guys who did PTI today were blown blown away by the interview. Like they're tweeting it out, Hawk. They never do this. They're saying five good minutes, must watch. All we can say is wow. 
about their uh, five minutes with Tyson. One of the guests that I've always wanted to get on this show, We've on tried. this very radio show, is Mike Tyson. Like, that's that's an interesting guest. They just told me one of the stories here. Can you share it, or you got to let it air first on TV? <laughs> One of the stories is pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> Eric Spolster is next. This is the Dan Lebetard Show. Let's quickly go here to Norbert. <laughs> Norbert? Really? With Stu Gatz and Hawkman. Okay, go ahead, man. Hey, how you doing? Good, Norb. This is 790. Norb. The Ticket. Great time down at the arena this morning, the parade, the entire day. Just an amazing day down at the American Airlines Arena. An amazing few days here for the Miami Heat and their head coach, Eric Spolstra. And he's getting set to join us right now on the 790 Guest Line presented by Bon Jovi DPS Sound Science, which makes your laptop, iPhone, and anything you connect to sound amazing. Try for yourself for free right now at 790theticket.com. Happy for this guy. He always carried himself with grace amid the turbulence. Eric Spolstra, champion Eric Spolstra with us on 790 The Ticket. Congratulations, Coach. Over the last uh, couple of days here, if I make you pitch one single emotional moment, the most emotional you were was blank. Having a moment with the trophy uh, with my dad. You know, my dad's been in the business for, you know, 30, 40 years. Uh, never been in part of a championship team. Uh, we were able to have a quiet moment with only the trophy, uh, and then we were actually able to get some photos of it. Uh, and it was on his birthday, so it was incredible timing. That's pretty cool. Uh, what was the difficult, uh, the most difficult time during all of this, Eric? Over the last two years, you would point to what period as the most difficult? Either the five-game losing streak uh, during the regular season uh, two years ago. Uh, I think that's when there was probably maybe a, a time where we were fighting some doubt. Uh, I would say I was uncomfortable during the 9-8 and eight start two years ago. Uh, once we got past those, uh, it seemed like we could deal with with everything. And even with me, I was able just to focus on the job and not really get concerned with too much uh, from the outside. In terms of absolute backs against the walls when we were down 2-1 to Indiana, uh, that's when we knew, um, all right, uh, we got to go. It's go time. Uh, Chris is out. Uh, no excuses. we got to figure this out. Let's find a way to scratch claw, do whatever it takes, hard foul, <laughs> anything. Let's just find a way to win this series. Two to one down to Indiana was scarier than down 3-2 to Boston, huh? Yeah, we had all our guns then. Uh, we felt we could win two in a row uh, against Boston. That, that We knew that that was going to be a competitive series, uh, and nothing was going to come easy. Uh, but if we could find a way to win game five, hey, that thing was coming back game seven. We had great confidence at home. When we were down 2-1, um, we had lost Chris. We knew he was, for two years, he was our most important player. We couldn't win without him. And not only that, we looked horrible when he wasn't playing. Uh, so that one was... Uh, we knew we'd have to reinvent ourselves. Everything would have to go right. We'd have to play hard, and, and other guys would have to step up, uh, which happened. Eric Spolster with us on 790, the ticket champion. So you go into Boston, and I was saying, Eric, that I can't remember in my lifetime covering sports a single athlete walking into an arena with more pressure than LeBron had on him in that game because people would then start wondering, are they going to break it up? Is the coach going to get fired? All of that stuff. You expected what from LeBron walking into that arena? A big moment. I really did. Uh, you know, he'd been mentioning it for a while that uh, no matter what during this playoff run and those big games, and that's what competition does. It brings out you know, sometimes the, uh, the worst in you, but sometimes the best in you. Uh, and uh, he made that commitment. We all made that commitment. We went through a lot of pain, you know, obviously last year. Uh, but we went through the summer with regret, a lot of us. I know I did. Uh, and LeBron kept on mentioning it during the playoffs. No matter what, he said, win, lose, or draw, I'm, there's going to be no regrets. Uh, and 
uh, he went in and absolutely attacked that game. I think we all felt that, that he was going to play magnificently like that. I'm not sure, but that he was going to bring it and there wouldn't be any regrets. Uh, but that game was uh, one for the record books, one for history. Um, it was a special moment. It seems like the way you're positioning it here, Coach, is it seems like that was a unique night. Have you not felt that way before any other game since you've been his head coach? It was a unique night uh, for all of us. Um, one, that we went into it with a lot of confidence. I, I was texting people uh, not to stress out, not to worry, not to listen to anything out there. I said, we're getting this one. Okay, then it's going to be pushed to a game seven. That will be the toughest game we've all ever had to play. Uh, but when we got to Boston in the first couple minutes of the game, you saw a look in LeBron's eye like like he was going to absolutely do, do whatever he had to dominate it. Uh, it gave all of us a, an incredible amount of confidence. How often do you do that, Eric, where you, you tell people, don't worry, we got this? Uh, not too often. I actually texted Pat the night before. <laughs> uh, and I said, uh, 17 years have prepared me, you, you've prepared me to – uh, lead this team in moments like this uh, and moments when it's not going to be easy. Uh, I told him to have a glass of wine and, and not listen to the noise or stress out that we were going to get game five. Eric Spolster with us on 790, the ticket. Uh, what was your period in the last two years? I mean, it may, it may be the same as the answer you just gave us, uh, of greatest doubt. Really, uh, it probably was uh, that 9-8 and eight start. Uh, our first year uh, of this team. Uh, and that's when you just don't know. I mean, uh, the the pieces were new, uh, you know, working LeBron and Dwayne together, uh, and we get off to that 500, basically a 500 start. It was like, man, does all this work? And uh, Do we have enough time to figure it out? And the pressure uh, and everything from outside was more than any of us had ever dealt with before. Uh, that's probably when I doubt. Then the playoffs this year, uh, even when we got down, we had a lot of confidence. Um, you know, we felt we could still win. And even uh, by that point, we had developed enough toughness that we weren't worried about what anybody else was saying. Uh, we were going into games thinking we were going to win, even when we were down in series. That, Eric, that game, uh, what was it, game four in Indiana, that's probably as much uh, our game. Yeah, game, yeah, game four. That's game as four. much confidence as we've had going into a game. I think we all felt we were going to win that game. Eric Spolster with us on 790 The Ticket. Can it be told now? You've won the championship. You're holding up the trophy. And and you handled, you did not feed any of the noise after it happened. But how pissed were you that Dwayne was screaming at you like that? Man, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, look, I don't understand what people, if you've been part of a team, you've been part of that. Uh, and you're yelling at each other. I, I've had more violent uh, exchanges with Adonis Haslam than I've had with Dwayne. But Dwayne and I have had ours. That's part of being a family. UD once, and this is when nobody was really watching us, so nobody really cared. <laughs> I mean, he slapped my clipboard out of my hand and it broke against the floor right when I'm like diagramming something and saying that this is important. And he said, that's not important. <laughs> Slammed it on the ground. <laughs> I mean, that was way more. And if that was in a playoff game that actually, you know, people watching, they would have made a big deal about that. Dwayne and I was, that's part of being part of a team. And if you, uh, if you've been around professional sports long enough, uh, you're going to have those moments unless you're running away from them. Unless you're trying to hide and you're, you're you're not looking, you know, you're not willing to embrace confrontation. Those are going to happen. I tell that all the time. When I, when I flew out and met, I meet with players all the time during the summer, and I tell them, uh, "Look, that's these are the parts I'm going to like. Right now, this is great. We're having lunch. Uh, ha ha. This is we're having fun. There's going to be a time uh, where you don't like me, but." Trust me, there's going to be a lot of times I don't like you either, uh, and those are the times that we're going to really grow from um, if we're strong enough to, to get past it. Well, give us an example. Eric Spolstra with us on 790 to take a champion. Eric Spolstra with us. Give us an example of the time that in the last two years where you could really feel that X player didn't like you. Jeez, uh, I mean, that's weekly with UD. Does that count? That probably doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's weekly. It doesn't count. Eric. No, no. UD and I are actually like brothers. Um, and in fact, in the playoffs this year, 
Or no, at some point during the regular season, he brought up in a team meeting because we weren't playing with enough fire. Oh, it was during that stretch when we were losing some games in March. And he sit, raised his hand in front of the whole team. He goes, I don't know, maybe you and I just need to have a, 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 one of our fights in front of everybody, just get everybody <laughs> fired up. He goes, I don't know if that's what it takes, but there's no passion right now. Um, I'm sure there are times, you know, where LeBron didn't like me, probably didn't like me during that 9-8 and eight stretch. Um you know, well, that was the time with Dwayne. He didn't like me. The role players, you know, when I was, uh, you know, changing their roles, I'm sure they they weren't cool with that at times. But that that's part of it. And those are really the times that you grow as a team. You don't grow when it's all good. Uh, it's those times. That it, seriously, if we, those those being down three straight series, if you haven't been through tough times, uh, where you haven't been able to to get through some adversity together, you don't have a chance during the playoffs. You don't have that resiliency and uh, the resourcefulness uh, that we showed. You're a champion. You're holding up the trophy. We can all look back and laugh at some of this stuff now. So please, while we're doing it, explain the Pittman start. Uh, That one, the bigger change, which went under the radar, and because I made that move, no one ever even noticed the other change. I made two changes in the starting line. The Battier. Yeah. yeah. That's right. That was the key one. Uh, and <laughs> he went, well, No, I thought the other one was the key one. <laughs> no, that was – and I, I say this out of respect to, to Pitt. That one was inconsequential. Uh, <laughs> right, right. It, it didn't matter. Uh, we were going to have to play three centers uh, against that team with Chris out, and it was going to have to be a three, uh, three-headed center monster. Uh, I figured his best minutes, if I were to do it, would be with our best players rather than bring him in, you know, with the reserves. Um, now, as it turned out, I only needed to play two centers against that uh, against that team, uh, and UD was really one of the one of the centers. Eric uh, but Spolstra. those moves aren't that big. The Battier move was much bigger, yeah. and um, that one was much riskier. Eric Spolster with us on 790 The Ticket. Obviously, that one worked out pretty huge. Of all the many uh, wrestling matches that you had to have, Eric, where Bosch doesn't want to play center, LeBron doesn't really want to be in the post, uh, Dwayne doesn't want to be the, the, the helper, the number two guy, the, the biggest wrestling match that you had trying to get a guy to do something that he didn't really want to do was what? Last year, when I started the process of playing LeBron a lot at the four, uh, and I, uh, that was tough uh, because you're talking about the best player in the game. Uh, and now uh, I'm playing him at different positions. I was playing him at so many different positions, which now is normal for him. Uh, but then when I put so much on his plate and then we struggled, we went lost those five games in a row, uh, he wanted to impact and dominate the, the game where he felt most comfortable, where he had won two MVPs. Uh, and he had dominated at the three position, and now I'm playing at every position but the three. Uh, you know, he had a valid point. Hey, if you want me to dominate, let me play my game. Um, but for us to, you know, really take the next step forward and, and for us to really unleash the versatility of our roster, uh, it took, you know, his maturity um, to sacrifice. That was probably the biggest sacrifice of, you, of anybody. You, you didn't really convince him, though, right? Losing convinced him. Failing convinced him. No, because you told us already that your biggest regret last year was not playing him more at the four during the playoffs. During the finals. I did a lot during uh, the playoffs. Um, during the finals, though. So, losing in pain uh, can be a major motivator. So what? It, so what? It, how does that work, though, Eric? Where he's fighting you on it, and how do you explain it? You go yeah, through those fight- weren't actually violent uh, arguments. That <laughs> was, that was a pretty rational argument. Mm-hmm. Um, that that one wasn't uh, a big deal, uh, and it was something that I understood. You know that when he was going through that that, that transition, uh, it was a little bit frustrating. But it wasn't something like, "Hey, this is BS." You know, let me get back to my game. It was like, "Okay, I'm, I'll I see it." Like he's very smart. He understood that for Mm -hmm. us to play our best players, he would have to play other positions. And then now what he did this year is absurd. Uh, And and that's why his his season was historic. Not only that he's an MVP, he's arguably the best defensive player in the league, but literally playing one through five uh, and doing that every single night and doing that without any thought like how it's going to affect his rhythm. He just did it and dominated it at all these different positions. We, We joked about it all the time on the court, uh, okay, that he's the best, 
You know, he's the best point guard. He, he's the best three man. He's the best four man. He's the best five. You know that we can play right now. Uh, how many times can we play him at all these different positions? Eric Spolster with us on 790 The Ticket. One of my favorite moments of Game 5 was Broken Miller, who came here to have that game. I think he wanted to have that game. He thought he was going to have that game for two seasons. Three fouls in the first half in nine minutes or whatever it was. You send Norris Cole to the scorer's table, and he waves you off, Spolstra. He says, get Cole back there, and I'm guessing that you loved that even though he picked up his fourth foul thirty seconds later, and you didn't love it then, <laughs> I'm guessing that you loved that he I waved laughed. you off. I actually laughed. I sent Norris up there, and he looked at me like I'm crazy. Like, but I understood exactly what he was motioning at. He's like, I never play anyway, so it doesn't matter right now if I pick up my fourth foul. All of that was with one hand gesture. It was the whole conversation that I understood what he was saying. So I laughed. And I was like, You're right. Why not keep you out there? You're not going to play 30 minutes, so if that means you get your fourth, who cares? <laughs> now, I didn't laugh when he picked up his fourth the next possession. I was like, Mike, just run away from him. You just hit three threes. Let's just let you go. Don't guard anybody. Let's keep it going. <laughs> but, Eric, you were waiting for him to have that game for two seasons. Yeah, and that's one of the most remarkable things. I mean, it's like we, you know, got to have, like, three people and a crane to lift him up off the floor. And he can't walk to the scorer's table, and then you give him a two-handed shove, and you shove him out there, and then he just moves around well enough, you know, and then to see him knock down those trees, uh, it's amazing. I don't know how many times my trainer, uh, Jay Sable, uh, just told me he, he should not be playing right now. And then finally Jay would just say it to nobody in particular. He should not be out there right now. And then uh, one time I turned to him and I said, uh, is he good to go? And he said, uh, look at him. <laughs> and I said, well, you lie to me or something. And so Jay and I had a laugh about that afterwards. So basically Miller played the entire postseason against doctor's wishes. Not Correct. the doctor, but the trainer. Uh, you know, Mike is, is one of the toughest guys. Uh, physically to be able to endure that type of pain. When anybody, you've probably had back pain at some point. Uh, it's the worst de debilitating pain you can have. I mean, when you have real severe back pain, uh, you can't even lay down comfortably. You can't find a spot in a chair to feel comfortable, much less run around and chase people in an NBA game. Can you tell us now how afraid the, the waves of fear, and I understand you have to stay in the game and you have to adjust and you have to bring in reinforcements, but how scared were you really when LeBron cramped up? Uh, I thought, Dan, at that point that we would have enough momentum um, to be able to somehow finish off the game and, and that we developed enough. Look, we had developed a lot of resourcefulness at that point where we had won games without Chris. We had won games with guys in foul trouble. We won games with Dwayne not feeling, you know, 110 uh, percent. And then all we needed was, you know, really about four minutes just to grind it out and find a way to win. I thought we could. Uh, I really did. Plus, I've also seen them be able to come out of the game, stretch it, come back, not be 100 percent, but at least be out there. Um, and he did. He knocked down, you know, the biggest three of that game. Uh, I was actually more surprised when he just he looked at me at the next time out, and I knew that you know he couldn't go back in. That was the first time I've ever had that look from him. He didn't say anything. He didn't say wave me off or anything. Just the look in his eye. So I subbed for him. If you had to choose one reason and one reason only, what would it be as far as why LeBron was so much better, so much more relaxed? At least it appeared that way in this NBA Finals as opposed to last year's NBA Finals. He's a great player. Come on. Uh, and when you go through something uh, like last year, and, and that's true greatness, uh, when uh, you look at something objectively, you own it. He didn't run away from it last year. Uh, he was open to everybody. That He said he didn't make enough you know, game-changing plays, uh, and he dedicated himself uh, to get better as the best player in the world, to, to add new elements to your game, and then came back. You know, just a dominant force in training camp and, and, and his will during the regular season. When he got back to that point, uh, you know, you just knew it. You knew that he was going to go into every single game and attack it to the point where he'd have absolutely no regrets.
the one moment, Spo, over the last two years where you have most wanted to spit at the media, but you restrained yourself. The the moment where you wanted to lash out a little bit. You've never done it really. Um, what was the moment? Oh, man, Dan, I don't know. I mean, you, you're actually making it sound like I care what you guys think or say. <laughs> I, I don't. I really don't. I mean, if it was coming from, I would be crushed. I, I Look, I've been upset. I'm not going to call guys out. Uh, I've been upset when I've been critiqued by former coaches. That pisses me off. All right, they've been in this chair. Whatever their agenda is, that's BS. Uh, and that's that's gotten back to me a couple times. If it's a media guy, who cares? Like they're not, they haven't played the game, they haven't coached the game, they haven't walked in these shoes. They don't know. I mean, I can't blame them for for not knowing. And, and it's competitive. Like if you're not coming up with a a storyline uh, that's probably got to be negative, it's not going to be listened to. So that I get. Uh, when it comes from uh, your peers that have actually been in this chair, uh, that I think is total BS. Last question, we'll get you out of here, and congratulations again. Uh, Dwayne Wade's going to need surgery on that knee, correct? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, uh, extended rest might do it. Uh, that hasn't been determined, but uh, it, we'll look at everything, though, to make sure that. But he wasn't himself, right, in terms of explosiveness? Well, I think a lot of people weren't. You know, the problem with that truncated schedule, it was just a, it was a blur, okay? Now you're also not coming into camp like in an absolute great court shape now a lot of our guys were professional they came in in great shape but that's different than running around on a court and being in basketball shape and then all of a sudden you play this blitzkrieg schedule game after game after game and then we had one day off from our last game of the regular season to the playoffs they're just not used to that your bodies aren't, aren't ready for that so they never had an opportunity to catch up i think if Dwayne had maybe a normal regular season i think he would have felt you know 100 percent probably or close to it very happy for you, Spo. Congratulations. You handled yourself in the way that this class organization um, is proud, makes it proud. So thank you for being on with us. Thanks, guys. I'll uh, catch up with you soon. Dan, thank I know you. I saw you on the on the beach. I'll probably see you a couple more times. Uh, I think I had that, like, written in my contract. Uh, I bumped into Dan on uh, a prime Italian. Uh, I think I haven't really been to South Beach a whole lot since uh, – since I was an assistant coach. Yeah, they've told you to stay away from there. <laughs> yeah. You don't come reason. <laughs> Trouble. <laughs> but now, now you can go. Now you're a champion. Now you can be on the beach. Uh, I think for a couple weeks, and then we're all going to get <laughs> try to get greedy again. <laughs> See you later, Eric. See you guys. Congratulations, Spud. Dan Levitard. I'm a dude playing a dude disguised as another dude. Stu Gatz. What do you mean, you people? What do you mean, you people? Here's Dan Levitard and Stu Gatz on Sports Talk 790, the ticket. You bet cross the line. Drums, please. <laughs> Went very long with Eric Spolstra there. That was very good. He was excellent. Uh, the Heat have called in and told us that we get LeBron after Oprah. So LeBron should be on with us here within the next couple of hours. We've got a short segment here because of how long we went with Spolstra. So, Walter, you're it for the segment. Whatever you provide, this will be the segment. Give it to us, Walter. Well, I hate to rain on your guys' parade, but I just called because I'm disappointed in the Heat organization. I spent two hours of travel time with my kids my family today to go down there to the parade. I'm not a season ticket holder, but a big fan. Got out there. Yeah, we saw the floats go by. But, like, that was it. It was like the whole day was geared to season ticket holders inside, nothing even on the screen, no, uh, you know, nothing, no shout-out to the crowd, no get on the microphone. Remember in 2006, Pat Riley was up there dancing for us in front of the stadium. The arena but this year it was just like a wave and goodbye a little disappointed and you know what's always been a class a organization i don't know how you guys feel about it a lot of people are making that complaint just so you understand the reason for that was they were expecting rain the forecast was 60 percent chance you can't have all those people out there in the rain you can't have your players and your buses out there in the rain and then beyond that last time they did this um a lot of people were passing out in the heat yeah 
And so they decided to do it inside this year. That's the reasoning for it. You don't have to like it, but that's the reasoning for it. We're back after this. This is the Dan Lebetard Show. I was sharing with everybody this Doug Flutie story when I was a young kid, Doug Flutie not giving me an autograph when I saw him at the uh, at a Bulls game. Flutie had just signed with the Chicago Bears. This guy calls in and he says, you're acting like a little kid that was spurned. He's like, you have your permit at that point. Old enough to sleep with Mark Sanchez. His mic is up. Dan did that thing where his mic's not on again. With Stu Guts and Hawkman. I made a good joke, too. I said, old enough to sleep with Mark Sanchez. Who now turned your mic off? Did you turn your own mic off? I don't remember. No, you <laughs> absolutely did. I watched you do it. It's the third time you've done it today, and you forget to turn it back I, I was on. thinking about this earlier today, by the way. When you're filming PTI, there have to be times where they say in your camera three and you just stare at a plant. <laughs> on 790 The Ticket. Drop! <laughs> I'm here to remind y'all. You guys really like the Eric Spolstra interview. Those were some good stories he was telling about Udonis Haslam knocking a clipboard out of his hands. Mike Miller, he kept asking the trainer, is he ready? And the trainer's like, look at him. He's not ready. He shouldn't be playing. And the trainer just gets to the point where he's just saying it to no one in general. He's just saying he shouldn't be playing. He shouldn't be out there. It's like, what am I doing here if no one's going to listen to me? (laughs) Why is he out there? Who are you talking to? I don't know, but I'm telling anyone. Mike Miller shouldn't be out there. What would you find most interesting about that Eric Spolstra interview? It was the Udonis Haslam story. I mean, to me, I was because usually I'm guessing that happens in practice and they keep that stuff private. But Spo is uh, maybe feeling his oats a little bit today. And you asked him point blank. You know, you can admit it now. What does that mean? Feeling oats? Feeling his oats. Sure. You're not feeling your oats after a big, uh, big victory. I don't I don't know what that expression is. You have a ratings means. victory. You don't feel your oats. But what what I, I don't. Well, anyway, keep going. I'm Here, sorry. Look at my oats. <laughs> Now watch me feel my oats. All right. You understand? Okay, now I understand. Thank you. So you ask him point blank, are you angry? You can admit it now. The season's over. Everybody's friendly. Are you angry that Dwayne Wade was yelling at you? And he's like, no, that's not That's not even feisty when it comes to being on an NBA team. And then he goes on and tells that story of Udonis. I want to know what happened in practice that caused Udonis well, It sounded Haslam. like it was in a game. It sounded like it was in a game, that Spo was drawing up a play in a game and that Udonis Haslam and, and was telling everybody, okay, this is important. And Udonis knocked it out of his hand saying, this isn't important, and just broke the clipboard on the floor. Oh, I took it to be in practice. But Udonis knocking the, uh, knocking the clipboard out of his hand. He said the clipboard shattered. That's a funny story right there. Well, here's what I um, liked best from that interview. And one of the things that was also interesting is LeBron. He said that the, the, the hardest thing to get someone to adapt to of all the things that had to be adapted to was getting LeBron to buy in on playing power forward. And even today, LeBron is telling people, I can't see myself playing power forward at 32 and 33 years old. I don't want, that's not how I want to play. I don't, which makes really amazing the postseason you just saw because he spent it at the rim. Like it's not like he took a lot of jump shots. He spent the whole thing at the rim, but I loved his response to. I don't care what you guys say. And I believe him. I absolutely believe him. And I've told you before that if I leave this radio show and there's someone in the parking lot and that person doesn't know one one thousandth about radio or about newspapers writing columns as I do. And every day I walk out there and that person is questioning me how I do my job. I feel like I'd be pretty immune to whatever it is that person was saying. And to me, that's an NBA coach or a coach of any sort. They know so much more about what they're doing than the people who are questioning them. And how about him saying, what pisses me off is when former coaches do it. I'm not mad that the media does it because basically what he's saying in so many words there, I know you guys are ignorant. Like, it doesn't bother me what you guys say. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know. Whenever I put Mike Miller in, you have no idea why I'm putting Mike Miller in. All of you watching, you don't know why, what I've seen to make that move. And you want to question me afterward or criticize afterward, that's fine. But what pissed him off is former coaches doing it because they ought to know better. They, they know how much goes into that job. Imagine, Hawk, if every day that you left here, 
somebody was in the parking lot or a group of people were in the parking lot who don't know anything about how to produce a radio show and they jump on you for producing a radio show poorly. I wouldn't take it well. Well, but I, I would not be immune to it. Well, you'd eventually become immune to I don't it. Know. You wouldn't be immune to it at the beginning, but you'd eventually become immune to it. I'm not certain that I would. I'm not certain that I would, and I don't blame guys for second guessing coaches too. Like Sam Mitchell came on, and he was second guessing, second guessing some of the things that Spo did. I mean, that's what we do in everything, though, right? I mean, we do it in sports, we do it in politics, we do it in finance. We're always second yeah, guessing but, but, people, and I understand we don't know anything about it. But here, here's the thing that I think makes this difficult as a sports fan and as a consumer of sports: you can do it in baseball. In baseball. All of the information is available to you, what a guy is against lefties. All of the data is out there so that someone who is super informed really can manage along with a baseball manager. But you can't do it in football, and you can't do it in basketball, and you can't do it in hockey. And I think the the problem is that people, because people can do it in baseball, they think they could do it along with the guy in basketball and and you simply can't. Well, I, I found it kind of telling because I was saying after that Dexter, Dexter Pittman disaster, I was saying that's the example of why Spolstra has no idea what he's doing. Like when Dexter Pittman started and then he played three minutes and then he never played again for the game, I was saying, there's your example. Here's a guy who doesn't know what they're doing. And now Spo comes on and he goes, that was completely didn't matter. Like it, inconsequential, it was inconsequential he said. is what he said. It was completely inconsequential. We were going to play three setters. Didn't matter who was out there at any given time. But doesn't it stand to reason, though, that now in retrospect, and we've talked about this, and I didn't understand why the Heat were an underdog against Oklahoma City because they had all of their pieces. Does it not stand to reason now in retrospect that a none of us were paying close enough attention to the fact? that the Heat were missing an all-star, and if Oklahoma City or Boston or San Antonio had been missing an all-star, they too would have looked on occasion like they were drowning. And does it not stand to reason now that the reason Dexter Pittman was in there is because they were scrambling, and bleep, yeah, they were scrambling. They were missing an all-star. Well, sure, now it makes sense. (laughs) How could they not be scrambling, though, when he's such a – I mean – He's an all-star. Like, it's not. This wasn't. They started Ronnie Turry off against the Pacers. When did you see him again after Bosch got back? That, that was pretty much it. Did anyone see Ronnie Turry off again? Yeah, you did. When they were up 25 at the end of game five and Scott Brooks was giving his concession speech. You didn't see Ronnie Turry off again. I saw Ronnie Turry off at the parade today. Guy was having a time. Guy was having a time. That guy's fun. I, uh. I'm looking forward. How will LeBron take this question when he joins us? I want to ask him the question, percentage of minutes, 0 to 100, percentage of minutes that Wade has been sober in the last four days. (laughs) He'll laugh at that, right? (laughs) He will laugh at that. Mike Lowell joins us next. And now it's time for the Mike Lowell Show. All right, Mike Lowell, congratulations. You pretty excited today? I'm pumped, man. I can't believe I'm on the Dan Levitard Show. <laughs> <laughs> the Mike Lowell Show is brought to you by Miami Lakes Auto Mall. Now seven brands, one location. Big on service, big on selection, big on savings. Miami Lakes Auto Mall. They tried to hit and ball trick, and I, and I think... They may have gotten the runner at third base, Luis Torero. Torero's out at third base. Mike Lowell had the ball. Here's Mike Lowell along with Dan Levitard, Stu Gutz, and Hawk on the flagship station for Miami Marlins baseball. 790 the ticket. If you want to talk to Mike Lowell, now's the time. 786-360-0790. Your favorite parade moment, Lowell. You've been in two of them. You are the World Series MVP of one of them. That had to be the best one, right, in that city? Um, yeah, for my ego, it was the best, yeah, because everyone's chanting MVP, and you feel like you're the greatest thing in the world, which is pretty good. <laughs> that had to be crazy. What was that period like for you? Um, you know, I, I actually took it in a lot better than I did in '03 with the Marlins because – 
since everything was a first with the Marlins, um, we didn't even know what to expect as a team. You know, I mean, our season could have been three extra days because we were going to San Francisco, or we were hoping it would be about three more weeks. So I think the fact that, you know, the Giants was who we, were who we played in the first round. They went to the World Series the year before. I'm not saying we knew we were going to win or knew we were going to lose. We knew we were playing good baseball. So when we beat them, especially with the play at the plate with Pudge and J.T. Snow and all that, it was just like, oh, my God, is this happening? Then the whole Cubs thing, and you move into Bartman and going down 3-1, it was just like you almost had to take each game, I know it's a cliche, but one day at a time because it was almost like emotionally – Overload. You couldn't. You can. You can deal with it. So I mean, the the going from game to game in the series to series was much more exciting with the Marlins. But the parade itself. I mean, Boston with the city. I mean, if you see how deep people are lined up in in the city of Boston for the parade, it's absolutely unbelievable. Well, what do you remember specifically? Take us back. Your World Series MVP. There's the parade. There are the days after the championship. The snapshots you remember, the mental, mental images you keep are what? Um, well, first, that uh, I flew up my whole family for it, which was really cool because, you know, I have pictures. You know, our team for have pictures of my son on my shoulder. We're on those duck boats. I don't know if you've been to Boston, but I had those, those kind of like trolley tours, but on duck boats. So that's where all the players were on. My son's on my shoulders. I'm holding the World Series trophy, and then the picture just drove the people all the way down. So that was just crazy. I mean, it was just – it was like a surreal moment. But I will say this. The, the funniest and most exciting time I've had in a parade was with the Marlins in 03. We were kind of down Biscayne Boulevard, and we were going to stop for lunch at Capitol Grill. Jeffrey Lawyer was buying everyone lunch at Capitol Grill, and they said, look, we're just going to go down A Street. We're going to go – down and back. We'll be back in 20 minutes. So all the wives were like, we've been down A Street. We'll just wait here and start ordering lunch. Well, the little yellow tape doesn't really stop all the Cubans on A Street. You need, like, the real barricades and the cops. And it took us, like, an hour and 45 minutes to go probably three miles because everyone was just jumping in front of the trolleys and everything. I mean, we had, like, two cops to to escort like four trolleys and it was absolute chaos i remember 97 when levon hernandez <laughs> when levon hernandez was going through that and he tried to make his way down calle ocho and buses would simply careen off the road to stop in front of him like calle ocho has got to be our most disorganized place in terms of celebrations well i will say this i took a little uh Took a little drive to a bird road in 87th at La Carreta after uh, game five. It was pretty chaotic uh, around there. I mean, you had the radio stations with their vans and people coming in tow trucks and pickups with their pots and pans. It was pretty exciting. What are the differences? Compare the two celebrations because they had to be totally different, right? Well, there's not one cazuela in Boston when you're celebrating. <laughs> I can Nobody, guarantee you that. Nobody's in the street with a pot or a pan. No, no. I got a kick out of some people uh, that I saw, and they big the big, big, big cazuelas, like the ones you have to carry with two arms. Right. And I was like, what is the point of bringing this big thing to A Street or Bird Road? You can't even carry it, let alone bang it. What is that? What? Why do we do that? Um, I don't know, because... I don't know. That's our way of making noise. And I, I will say this. It was, it's good fun. I mean, they weren't flipping over cars and burning down, you know, burning down police cars and trying to flip them over and all that stuff. I think that's good fun. Who cares? Make your noise and enjoy the team that just won a championship. Got some open phone lines here if you want to talk to Mike Lowell, 786-360-0790. We've been talking about Mario Chalmers and a guy whose confidence is borderline delusional. Spolstra says Chalmers is the most confident guy on the team. Wade and LeBron both say that Chalmers thinks that he's better than they are. Who's a guy you played with or against where his confidence was much bigger than how good he was? Wow, that's a good one. Confidence. Let's see. Um, well, I will say this. I know he's a really good player now, but Dustin Pedroia hit 190 for like a month and a half when he first got called up. Now, I don't care who you are, Bryce Harper, Alex Rodriguez, whatever phenom in the world, when you get to the big leagues and you're unproven, there is no way you know you're going to be successful. You have to prove it to yourself. I mean, unless my mindset is totally ridiculous, I think – you become confident because of your results 
at the beginning. You can have a confident attitude in your in your abilities, but to know that you're going to be really good at that level when you've never even played, that for me, that's impossible. And Pedroia, being a guy who's 5'7", 165, soaking wet, you hear him talking, everyone, you know, at the beginning of the game, come on, guys, have a good game, have a good game. And he goes, I'm going to light this guy up. I'm going to light this guy up. And I'm like, you have five at-bats in the big leagues, and you have four strikeouts. How are you going to light this guy up? Why don't you hit a dribbler up the middle and get a base hit? So he was the guy that, I don't know if it was his way of just pumping himself up or uh, or, or true confidence. I don't know. But he always said, I'm, I'm going to light this guy up. This guy has no idea. He, has, he better put on welding goggles because of the sparks that are going to come off my back. <laughs> Those are things he would say. And I'm like, this is unbelievable. <laughs> Uh, that's a, See, that's interesting, though, because Billy Bean, uh, before he was a general manager, he was a five-tool baseball player, first-round pick, and he realized that he wasn't quite cut out for it because he was in the dugout, and Lenny Dykstra was, this is in the minor leagues, was next to him, and he, he Lenny Dykstra would just be pounding on on the on the steps with his bat, I'm going to crush this guy, I'm going to crush this guy, and, and Billy Bean would be like, that's Steve Carlton. Like what's, like what's, and he didn't even know his name, but he was just fearless about it. Yeah, I tell you that it's interesting, especially a guy like him who I know we all see the movie uh, Moneyball and all that, but he was he was the guy, you know, he was that tools guy that everyone wanted. And you'd think, and for me, actually, mo- a lot of the major league players that are some of the greatest in the game, when you get to know them, I don't. I, I guess I shouldn't be shocked, but I guess the normal attitude is to put them on a pedestal, a lot of guys are insecure. And I don't know if they're insecure is because they're so good at baseball that they think that their baseball skills don't measure up to other things and they, they, they feel like they might have to be that good in everything. But I, I'm always taken aback by how some really, really good players are somewhat insecure. Maybe that's what drives them too. But, uh, yeah, I'm with you. You know, Billy Bean is that guy who was the the scout's dream. He was the guy with the total makeup, but it shows you it's it's not the, it, for me. I know you hate the intangibles, but there there's a there's an it factor. There's a swagger factor that it can't be it can't be quantified that is a big deal when it comes to, you know, getting to the next level. We come back with your calls for Mike Lowell after this. And now back to the Mike Lowell Show. You guys let them off the hook, Lowell. You had them finished. All you got to do is win more than one game. Well, thanks there, genius. And don't you think we wanted to win? The Mike Lowell Show is brought to you by Miami Lakes Auto Mall. Now seven brands, one location. Big on service, big on selection, big on savings. Miami Lakes Auto Mall. Mike Lowell has struck for a two-run homer. His first Marlin home run, and it left absolutely no doubt. Here's Mike Lowell, along with Dan Levitard, Stu Gatz, and Hawk on the flagship station for Miami Marlins baseball. 790 the ticket. Get in here now, 786-360-0790. We're expecting to have LeBron James here before the end of the show, as soon as he's done with Oprah. What was the moment, Lowell, where you looked around being interviewed by Oprah or you found yourself at the White House? The one moment that you had where you looked around and said to yourself, I can't believe that baseball has brought me all the way up here. Oh, that was a uh, that'd be a dinner with President George Bush. Uh, he invited uh, I think it's uh, George Will um, kind of organized organized a dinner each year, a baseball themed dinner with the president and his wife. And it was Terry Francona, myself, Jimmy Rollins went because he was the MVP in the National League. Um, Curtis Granderson went because I think he was the first player in I don't know how many years to have 20-plus homers, doubles, triples. And it was just, I was like, okay, I'm here having dinner with the president, and he's asking us if it's hard to hit in Yankee Stadium when they're yelling at you. (laughs) And I'm like, uh, is it hard to uh, deliver news when people want to try to bomb us? I don't know. So it was re- it was really cool. It was really cool. I, I realized that I would never want his job or have the responsibility of the president. It's just so overwhelming. What uh, what were your qualifications to be at that meal? I mean, was it because you were just coming off of World Series MVP? That's a random list of players you gave me. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, yeah, it was. It was basically that the guys during the season that um, I guess 
won certain awards. Um, you know, Frank Cohen was a manager. We had just won the World Series. I won the MVP. You know, Jimmy Rollins was the was the MVP of the National League. Uh, yeah, it was just I, I don't know how everything came together. I know Julio Franco was there because he played for the Rangers when uh, President Bush was the owner. So it was cool. It was, it was a good mix of people. It was, it was uh, you know, uh, you had a manager, you had an infielder, you had outfielders, you had a former player. It was it was really it was a really cool dinner. Do you remember what you asked him? I do. I remembered. Uh, I, I asked him two things. He took us to uh, the Oval Office, and you know, he's telling us how I guess each president can kind of put things of what he likes in in certain parts of, in certain parts of the office and what he likes to do. And I. I asked him where the poker room was. <laughs> he said, "Oh, believe it or not, we got a room upstairs where a few of my buddies play hold'em." And I was like, "Wow, this is great." I'm sure he had so much time to play hold'em, but uh, I figured that'd be another pretty cool invite if you could. Hey, this is the president. You guys want to play some Texas hold'em? It's gonna be five ten. You guys want to buy in? And the other question? What was the other question? That's fine. We can move on. If you yeah, move on. Next question. Robert, you're on with Lowell. Hey, uh, Lowell, just wanted to ask a couple of things. Do you think the Eucalyptus uh, situation in Boston would have ha- been handled more diplomatically if uh, Theo and Francona was still there? And would you consider Eucalyptus, he's 33, is he an old 33? Good question. Um, I, I think Terry Francona is very careful. He's always been very careful of how he uh, – portrays or criticizes players in the media. I think that that's a little bit of a difference there. Bobby Valentine is a little more outspoken, and I think coming to a new team, especially with the Euclid thing in spring training where he said he didn't seem like Euclid was into it, uh, that's a different style for sure. Um, I just don't know the dynamics of what came about. You know, I didn't know how hurt Euclid was. Obviously, this young kid, Middlebrooks, looks to be a guy that, you know, he's a run producer, power bat. He's hitting for average. So that whole dynamic was probably a little bit awkward because when you get a young guy who comes in who they think is just for 10 days and he absolutely performs, home runs, RBIs, playing defense, everything, and you are not playing well, um, that's tough. And for 33, no, I don't think Euclid is done. It just seems like his injuries have, uh, have slowed him down significantly. I mean, this guy was, I think, in a span of three years, maybe behind Pujols and Miguel Cabrera, the top OPS guy in the major leagues. I mean, you're going from that to basically being traded for nothing. Because, I, I mean, the Red Sox are swallowing 75% of that salary and got a backup infielder and a triple-A pitcher. I mean, that that's not a lot for Kevin Euclid. Ben, you're on with Lowell. Did you say Ben? Yes, sir. Okay, sorry about that. Mike, um, I was recently in Chicago, and I heard a guy on the radio talking about Manny Ramirez saying – uh, when he stared off into the distance, he was actually doing like eye exercises. He told the story about Manny had a trainer that would spin like a hoop with four different colored balls on it, and he would call out a color, and Manny would reach out with one hand and grab that colored ball as fun, and apparently none of the other players could do it. Can you, uh, can you speak on this at all? Yeah, absolutely. He, uh, he had – actually, it was our strength coach who'd throw him these rings, and it was in the, it was in the locker room, and – I mean, there's a lot of different exercises the guys do, but yeah, he had a hoop thing, and um, I don't think it was so much that guys didn't do it. I think guys preferred not to do it because it wasn't hard to do, but it was a training exercise for your eyes. And if you notice, especially in Fenway, um, he looks like he's always staring in the dugout before he steps into the batter's box, and he says there's this one pillar, one pole that he would stare at, and he said it would just it would lock him in in order to him to get his rhythm to then concentrate on the pitcher. And he absolutely did it. I mean, uh, there's no secret to that, and, and it worked. I mean, obviously he's one of the best hitters I've ever seen. But I'm not but, understanding. What is what is the, the rings? What was that? I, um, you know, it was just it was like a hoop that had different parts colored. And, and, uh, and I guess whichever one it comes close to your hand, he would want to call out the color that his hand would grab. It was, it's just a, it was more of a focusing exercise. I wouldn't say it's... You know, it's some savant type thing. It's just, it was an, it's a focus on, con, it's an exercise on concentration and focusing and kind of, you know, a lot of people say your eyes are muscles as well. And if you kind of gear them up, they'll be sharper when it's time to, you know, when it's time to perform. Ben, you're on with Lowell. Uh, Lowell, question for you. A couple of weeks ago, there was an Oakland A's player who was released days before his wife was giving birth to their, like, newborn twins. And I was wondering, what is the coldest transaction that you've seen by a front office? And throughout your years in uh, majors, 
Wow. i got to say, um, being an Oakland A's player, getting released two days before you have your baby. <laughs> I can't think of one. I mean, that's pretty rough. You don't remember some, a particularly cold transaction that showed you? Well, the minor leagues are cold, man. You get... I mean, when the coach call, calls you in and they say, well, they've made a decision, you know, back in, you know, when I was with the Yankees back in Tampa, we're letting you go. I mean, that hurts when you see a 22, 21-year-old kid and they give them, you know, uh, here's here's your ticket home. Then what do you do? You know, especially guys that sign out of college and all that and maybe played the minor leagues four or five years, that's tough to go back to school and start four years of college. So, that I mean, there's a lot of situations where, you feel bad for guys, but I don't know. I guess that's why so many guys chase the dream. But I don't, I don't really recall anything like harsh like that. I mean, you know, having a kid or going like, or you know, having some financial troubles and they just release. You know, Steve, you're on with Mike Lowell. Hey, Mike. Uh, thanks for being a Marlin. Uh, two questions for you. First, every athlete wants an edge somehow, some way. Um, what was your edge? Was it nutritionally or training? Uh, desire, and my other question is, do you think we put too much emphasis on sports uh, as an athlete? Take care now. Your edge was uh, being able to turn on the inside pitch, no? Well, I think that was my my gift, but I, I think my edge was to find motivation. Um, I, I felt like physically a lot of guys were more gifted than I was, so my motivation was I would pick days in the off season. You know, I do my regular strength and conditioning routine but i would pick days where i really could bet that most guys were not working like i would definitely go work out thanksgiving morning and uh you know christmas morning after you know my kids open this ride go run because i figured that no one on christmas day would be doing any type of exercise now maybe i was wrong but at least in my mind i thought most people weren't um so i I think it was just a motivational edge you know that i had a lot of people you know you know, a lot of scouts and stuff tell me that I couldn't do things, and I think that was my motivation to try to prove people wrong. Settle a debate for us here as a parent, Lowell. I believe that uh, that Mark Hockman, producer of this show, has robbed his child of a memory today. Has, has, <laughs> what do you do? Here's what's happened, all right? His, he was invited on the float uh, to be a part of the parade with the Heat, and he was invited to bring his child, who is a sports fan and is eight years old. Uh, but Hawk is doing the morning show, and so that would have required bringing his son at 5 a.m. Uh, to work with him and then because there was a parking situation and then having him wait. Anyway, the long story, short story is that his son, he didn't want to inconvenience him. It was too long a day, and I say that's bad parenting. You say what? Um, the kid's eight, and he's a big Heat fan? Yeah, he's, he's a big Heat fan, but I would like I had to leave Boca today at 4.30 to get down to the arena. I say I, he's I, a I bad parent. I would have had to have my son stay with me at the morning show till 10 a.m., then get on the back of the flatbed, wait for the parade to leave at 11. Would have been a long-ass day. Okay, let me ask you this. On the float, is he with one of some of the players? No, we were on a loser float. Will he? Would he have met any of the players? No. Those are good questions, Lowell. Yeah, would he be able to wave to the crowd? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we were on the float. And, we and, the the, and they could float. see, like, Mike Miller was in the float behind them. I mean, they could. Okay, okay. Let's settle it. Hawk, you're a bad parent. Thank oh, you. That's terrible. Thank Lowell, you, Mike. I know you don't really Thank agree you. with yes. that. You just don't want to get into an argument with Dan. <laughs> Thank you, Lowell. A terrible parent. Well, Dan doesn't have kids. He doesn't know what it is to be a parent. Well, you know, you wouldn't. I mean, would you take your eight year old son? Uh, would you wake him at 4 30 in the if morning I, to if drive I around told on the you, back Lowell, of a How old are your kids? How old six hours later? My kids are 10 and 7. Yeah, my kid went on the float. He went on the float. He yeah, was, but what you, are wait we? a second. No, 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 wait a second. Your kid's experience on the float would have been vastly different than my no, but kid's Mike, experience on the float. Mike, if I gave you the opportunity today to be on the float with your son, but it required getting up at 5 in the morning. No, me me today for a heat float? No, because I don't, I don't, I'm, I don't, I don't belong in that situation. Well, neither does Hawk. Well, no, he does. He covers the heat in the morning. I, I'm, I'm just... I'm a former player of another sport who was a fan and was really excited that he won, but I don't know. I don't belong there. Well, let me ask you, because uh, now I feel badly. Can I make it up to him? Can Can you come up to Boca and we can all go to dinner with my son? He can take some pictures with you. Maybe you can. Hey, could you wear your Marlins can uniform? You okay, we'll Boca. do that. Tell him, hey, you, you could have had a chance to meet LeBron James, but I got Mike Lowell to give you a soda. 
Can you come to Boca? I mean, if you wear your Marlins uniform, he'll understand. No, he's, like, he's going to be like, oh, those are the old Marlins? <laughs> That's what he's going to say. See you later, Lowell. All right, take care, guys. This is the Dan Lebetard Show. All criticism welcome here at 790 The Ticket. With Stu Gatz and Hawkman. All right, what do you got? Dan, this is what I don't like about you. You pick and choose what is right and what's wrong to talk about. Either talk about it all or shut up and don't talk. Let's try the show where you don't talk. This is 790. Hamburg. The ticket. Hey, yo, man, my label mate, Don Newkirk, man, step to him. Thanks, Search. And now for the Prime Minister. Texture writes in, if Hawk had brains, he would have rented a hotel room downtown and stayed there last night for the once-in-a-lifetime experience. To be convenient enough for him, another text writes in, your kid would have had a once-in-a-lifetime experience to be part of a parade, something a child would never forget, and get to tell his friends, shame on you to be in that kind of spot, and you said no because it inconvenienced you. Wow. It didn't inconvenience me. It inconvenienced my son, and you all go back to parenting your own children. I'll parent mine. Thank you. Eric Spolster joined us earlier in the show. Eric Spolster was exceptional. He's relaxed. He's a champion now. So he's, a, he's in champion mode. He's he, in champion he's just mode, happy. right? You get a different interview when a guy is happy and 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 immune, bulletproof. Does he sound different to you because he's a champion? He sounds different to me, but I don't know if I'm doing this whole champion thing. No, he sounded different since he got the three guys. They emboldened him. He has sounded different True. since he had them. And I, I like talking to him. Um, Eric Spolster is very relaxed. This is the Dan Lebetard Show. NBA and NFL lockouts. Are you ready for some cricket? <laughs> Monday night cricket? Oh, my rowdy friends are going to come over. I don't know. I don't know the difference between a hippie and a hipster, but it's fun to watch either one of them get beat up. With Stu Gatz and Hawkman. President Obama is a phenomenal player at basketball for a president of the United States. But I think he's just mediocre for a black guy. <laughs> On 790 The Ticket. LeBron, James, did Oprah, and then vanished. So he will not be on with us. He has had a great many media obligations over the course of the last few days. And so hopefully we'll be able to get him on at some point later this week. But he will not be on today. If you want to talk about the parade today, 786-360-0790 is the telephone number. If you want to text us, it's 67974. Texter writes in, you annoyed Coach Spolstra on a happy day, Dan. How did I annoy him? Did you annoy him? I didn't feel like I annoyed him or didn't annoy him any more than media questions generally annoy him. Well, I think Spo's new MO, by the way, is to always sound annoyed. That's like his, I've noticed that ever since they got the big three. Like his whole thing is whatever you ask, he'll kind of give up. Well, Dan, come on. And uh, I don't care about that. And I, I know you believe him. I don't buy three quarters of the stuff that he's saying. So you don't buy, you do not buy that. Here, here's what I believe, because I think you don't believe that a human being would be immune to criticism, that Correct. it's, it, that it's human to be annoyed by people ravaging you. But in my experience, and I don't believe I'm as confident as what I do for a living as Eric Spolstra is in what he does for a living. He feels prepared. He's been tested. He's worked at the knee of Riley for many years. He feels ready for this. So I'm guessing that I'm not as confident in what I do as Eric Spolstra is and what he does. But I can tell you that criticism, like if you come after me about stuff that I'm sensitive about, I can understand where that criticism would affect me. But if you come at me for not being a good writer or being crappy at radio, 
I'm going to shrug my shoulders at you. You remember when the television show started? I wasn't confident in what we were doing. So I totally avoided everything that had to do with criticism because I wasn't confident in what I was doing. So criticism was going to sting me. But you come at me about this radio show or my newspaper column. I don't care. I really don't. Do you, you you think I'm being insincere when I say that? I don't know. I find it very, it's almost inhuman to say, like, you don't, you, it, you 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 write a column for the Herald and then it gets posted at herald dot com mm-hmm. and then people put their comments after the column. You don't read them at all. No. If you did and you saw that it was criticism after criticism, wouldn't affect you at all. The only way it would affect me if it was writers who are better than I am, who writers who I respect so much. And they were picking it apart. If it were people who know more about what I do for a living than I do. That's my point when it comes to media criticism of Eric Spolstra. He knows that the people criticizing him don't know a fraction as much as he does about basketball and what goes into his job. So why would the criticism of the ignorant bother you? Why would the criticism of the ill-informed bother you? If you believe... Look, let's take it back to the conversation we were having earlier. You didn't bring your son today to the parade with an invitation. You had an invitation to have your son in the parade float today, and I'm criticizing you. And that criticism doesn't bother you not one ounce because you know how good a father you are and because I'm not a father. Like, you don't look at me and say, Dan's a better father than I am. Dan has more parenting skills than I am. So the criticism that I'm lobbing at you, you laugh it off. You laugh in my face. I guess so, although if I was hearing it from all over the place constantly, because here's all that Eric Spolstra had. Look, he can say that he avoids the newspaper and avoids TV and avoids radio. But you have to know, you can't live in such a bubble that you don't know when people are saying you're unqualified to do something. Something. Even if the people saying it are unqualified no, but an, to say. No, but that's an important distinction you're making. What did he say? He just said that what really pissed him off is fellow coaches right. saying it. Criticism from fellow coaches. But if the masses, Hawk, if you know the people criticizing you are ill-equipped to be properly informed on the criticism... Why would that bother you? I don't know. I feel like it would still sting. And the thing is, I, I, I hope you're right, because I have felt bad on the morning show. I've criticized Eric Spolstra. I don't know anything about coaching basketball. And I have gone out of my way. Now, when they're winning, I'm all I'm all on the Spolstra bandwagon. Like, I'm all for but him knows, sticking around for years. He knows it's that conditional. Um, he knows that your criticism is based almost exclusively on whether they win or lose, not whether he did a good job. I've told you before, one bleep in time, one bleep in time. I want to hear a fan or media member look at the winning coach and criticize him as being out coached in the game because it's happened. It's, I'm sure there are games this season where Eric Spolstra has gone against the Bobcats or the Hornets and been out coached, and it didn't matter because he had so many better players. Well, let me ask you this. Do you think if Eric Spolstra had lost the championship, he would come on and say with the same vigor, I don't care what the media says? Yes, I believe that he doesn't give a bleep. What the media says. Really? Not a bleep. I mean, because it's easy to say it today. You no, just had of course. a. You just you just drove through downtown Miami in the in the back of a pickup truck in a parade. But think for about you. what. But what think about what I'm saying? Unless that media member is a former coach of some sort, because again, Hawk, I just don't see. I don't see how it is that if you have the confidence of your convictions, if you believe in what you do. To me, Hawk, this is what it's like. You are a radio producer. You've been a radio producer for a long time. You are successful as a radio producer. I understand you being stung by criticism from other radio producers or a better radio producer. But to me, the media covering basketball, it's like a fourth grade class criticizing your radio production. Right. We're not qualified but we have loud voices and we can make arguments. <laughs> so do so do a, a classroom full of fourth graders. 
They have loud voices, too, and they make a lot of noise, too. We have a transmitter. <laughs> right, right. I, like, I can penetrate wherever Eric Spolstra is. Right. If he's inside a house, inside an apartment, my voice can be there if he so chooses. Well, I can understand why that might be annoying. Right. Why it would be annoying, but I don't understand why it is that you would absorb that criticism. But, uh, to me, this is how you, this is how Eric Spolstra's life would be. He's coached the game. He's lost. He feels crappy. He gets into his car in the morning, and your morning show is on. And you're there making jokes about how bad he is at his job. To me, he's listening to that and saying, this clown doesn't know anything. It's not, ooh, let me listen to what this clown has to say. This is extra hurtful. You don't think he's turning up the volume and it's stinging him? <laughs> no. See, that's the way I picture it. But he just told you. So you think he's lying through his teeth it's, when he's telling? It's not that I think he's lying through his teeth. I just think he's coming off a championship parade in downtown Miami. It's very easy to but, say but whatever said, you want to say. But, but he said it for two years that he does not care what I say. He, he That answer, in some form, has been on this radio show a number of times. When I ask him about media criticism and he comes back and us with Dan. You assume I care what you say. Keep in mind, this guy, Hawk, this guy is studying hours of tape. Right. Hours of tape. I don't study hours of tape. I only watch half the game. This is the Dan Levitard Show. Pants on the ground, pants on the ground, looking like a fool with your pants on the ground, with the gold in your mouth, hat turned sideways, pants hit the ground, call yourself a cool cat, looking like a fool, walking down town with your pants on the ground, get it up. With Stu Guts and Hawkman. <laughs> hey, get your pants off the ground, looking like a fool, walking, talking with your pants on the ground, get it up. Yeah, yeah. Hey, get your pants. On 790 The Ticket. You know, I have a horrible feeling that song could be a hit. Texter's writing in mocking us because LeBron James did not appear here and he was with Oprah. I am being told that there's still the possibility that we will get him this week. He just did a lot of things today and was ready to leave the arena. But if you're going to lose out on an interview, I mean, Oprah. I mean, she probably has not lost out on an interview in 15 years. So. Well, here's the other thing, too, though, that Oprah gets. How about this one, Hawk? And I'm not sure. I know she's Oprah. I'm not sure how relevant she is right now with her new channel. I don't know how many people are watching her. Like, I know Bob Costas is great, but I also know that this new show that Bob Costas is doing, he gets all these great guests and nobody's watching it. Like, there are 90,000 people watching it. Um, but here's what, what just happened with Oprah. Oprah not only swoops in, she swoops in, and she doesn't get just LeBron. She gets the three of them, and she doesn't only get the three of them. They are dressed in their finest suits while sitting with Oprah Winfrey. And I don't even know, do people still watch Oprah? Is she readily available? I know she's got her own channel, but are there a lot of people watching that channel? Well, I was teasing you before when I said, how dare you say she's not relevant? No one is watching that channel. No one. And and she had she had started owning her own, and I think it's called Own Oprah Winfrey Network. She had started doing that a while ago, and they've never been able to gain traction with a hit show. They did like an, an after Oprah show, but nowhere near what she was doing. Although, admittedly, I would I would guess that she didn't think network TV syndication was going to be anywhere near the Own Network, but there's no one watching that well, channel. Well, you want to guess, uh, I was in New York City, and this tells you the power of networks or the power of brand names. I think ESPN has to be, in America, I think the letters ESPN have to be in the top 10 in terms of brand recognition, top 10. Easily. I'm, like with Coca-Cola, McDonald's, I'm putting it up there with whatever it is that you put it up there, top 10. Jim Rome left ESPN. You want to take a guess. Now, keep in mind, the advertising on Jim Rome that I saw in New York City alone, his picture was on every block. You want to take a guess at how many people are watching Jim Rome's show on CBS? Well, I wouldn't even know where to find it. 40,000. 40, oh, yeah. 
40,000. That's fewer than listen to this radio right. show. That's local radio on the low end. That's bad local radio. Wow. Now, that's on the CBS Sports Network, right? Yes. People don't know where to find it. I'm guessing it's the same thing with Oprah, where when she had a national, when she had her audience, the network. Here's my point being this anyone can leave ESPN without denting ESPN. ESPN makes people, it's not the other way around. And even someone as big as Oprah Winfrey needs the help and the reach given by comfort and familiarity that there is in watching what you're used to watching. That even someone with the scope and size of Oprah Winfrey and the audience that she has, it's not going to follow her. That's one of the reasons. I don't know what. Do you, was it a good investment that Sirius and XM made in, or whichever it was, in Howard Stern? Because he has a monster audience. I think Bill Simmons is actually the only one at ESPN who could take a great deal of audience with him wherever if he, he goes. goes. Yes, Howard Stern was probably a good investment because they gained over the course of the of his contract ten to twelve million subscribers, and those are monthly paying subscribers. Uh, Oprah, it has not been that same way. In fact, Oprah has a channel on on satellite radio, and that hasn't done anything for them either. Very difficult. Here's the weird thing too. I, I know I, I, you're probably the same way. Like I know on my cable system at home. The 400s are the high-def channels. So I go from like 401, which is Sun Sports, and 402, I'll watch Marlins or Panthers or Heat Games, and then I'll get to like 435. That's my that's my wheelhouse of channels. It's not a big deal for me to punch in 725 or whatever it is, and that's where MLB Network is, but that's too far down on the channel list <laughs> for me. But I don't know why. I'm not doing anything different. It's too much of an effort. It's too much of an effort, but I'm punching in four numbers anyway. I don't know what I don't know what the holdup is there. Did you see uh, Did you see the Tyson interview on Pardon the Interruption? Did you I see? D- it? I did not. One of the stories that he told was after breaking up uh, or divorcing Robin Givens that occasionally he would still go over there for booty calls. Makes sense. And evidently, one day he was over there in the driveway all excited, revved up for his booty call, and she pulls in with Brad Pitt. Oh, get out of here. <laughs> and he's relaying this story yes, on PTI? he was relaying this story on Pardon the Interruption. She pulls in with Brad Pitt, and I'm guessing that that was crushing for the both of them because Brad Pitt had to be filled with unbelievable fear and Tyson had to be filled with you what what just happened here like you're bringing your Brad Pitt you're going home with Robin Givens you're not going to get a tour of her house mm-hmm. and Robin Givens is very pretty yes and Brad Pitt is as well yes so now but he's thinking to himself as they're driving over there wow this woman has been married to Mike Tyson this is like I'm I'm getting into serious bedlam here. That has to be terrifying if you're Brad Pitt pulling up in that Well, driveway. you're just thinking about it. Like it's in the back of your mind. Wow, this girl used to be married to like I would imagine the Carmen Electra, it's the same thing. This girl used to be married to Dennis Rodman. Like you're you're just thinking about all the different scenarios. Well, but Rodman's not scary. Tyson's terrifying. Rodman scares me, I think, more than Mike Tyson does. No. No. I don't know. He's he's more of a loose cannon, isn't he? Of course, what? Tyson did time for rape. What? What? All right, so I'll, I'll backtrack on that one. Although Rodman is a loose cannon, you I'll can't. Grant you I he's... believe Rodman starred in a movie yeah. called Loose yeah. Cannons. Uh, Rodman is a loose cannon. Didn't but... he do a movie with Van Damme called Loose Cannons? Double team. Oh, it was double team. <laughs> what happened to Dennis Rodman's movie career? Chris, you're on 790 The Ticket, Chris. You know, I didn't hear you guys talk at all about Stuart Scott's interview with Bosch. Right as the confetti is still streaming down, he chose to go with, how do you feel about being the forgotten member of the Big Three? I just thought that was kind of an inappropriate moment in putting him on the spot. There were a couple of questions asked in the post game that made people groan. Uh, I thought Stuart Scott asked a good question of LeBron. What's the criticism that hurts you the most? But people didn't want to hear. It was the right time, though. Yeah, an unusual time for it. And I think it was like just a second question, second question on LeBron. Was well, kind of douchey, too. In the, I mean, you're talking, can, he, that guy's right, confetti is streaming down, you're on national TV, and all the fans are there in the arena. What's it like to be the forgotten member of the big three? How does he answer that? Well, Bosch is so kind. He's so nice. Kind, but Bosch, 
and, and this is a frustration that you folks have had with him for two years. Um, Bosch is a gentle creature. How do you feel about that appraisal? But he's not really a gentle creature. <laughs> but he'll answer anything politely and nicely. He's a polite creature. Mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily certain that he's a gentle creature. What are you objecting to there? Well, no, I just don't think he's gentle. I don't think he's gentle on the basketball court. The guy has a ferocity. Nobody can can rev up a crowd. Like, to me, when I think gentle, I think A.C. Green. Like, you're never going to see A.C. Green with that big velociraptor scowl that Chris Bosh does after a big bucket. But polite, polite as hell. I think of Bosh as kind. Kind. How's kind? Do you like kind better? I, Bosh is my favorite Heat player. Really? Yes, I just love his personality. I love I, I I love that this guy is willing to show you his vulnerabilities. Like he's not wrapped in he's not wrapped in bravado. He's not always trying to show you how tough he is. He's willing to articulate his uh his frailties. I love that about that dude. Mike Miller runs up to you right after they win the NBA championship, gives you an embrace like you haven't had in years. And Chris Bosh is your favorite heat player? I mean, I thought I knew you. I don't even understand what you're doing. There. I don't know what I'm doing there either. So I go to 725, and, like, there's the MLB network. But I can't even get there because I go to the 400s. Do you Ke watch HGTV? Kevin, you're on 790, the ticket, Kevin. Hey, um, well, first off, highly questionable is brilliant, and your answer amazing. Second of all, I was at the indoor arena today, and, I mean, I was in the upper deck, and I thought, I thought it was great, you know, they came out and everything, but... The audio has to be fixed for next year. I couldn't hear anything anybody was saying. And then I thought the kind of random the random um, order of the interviews were kind of weird. But anyway, and, and I, I agree with the Tony Ferentino and everything. Like, you know, they, and Jason Jackson. Like, I love those guys, but they I feel like they kind of were still in the show. But, but anyway, the last thing I want to say before I go is that I'm sure they've offered it to you, but you need to get on first take and go do like a more Cuban spot against the Bayless because that would be epic. I turned that down last week while they were here in Miami. They were. They wanted me to do first take, and I really didn't want to do first take. I can't believe you turned down first take. You always amaze me because in the eight, nine years that we've been doing this radio show, if I remember correctly, the only TV show that you've really agreed to do and gone on and done is Hannity and Combs, inexplicably. Like, all these great well, sports did, shows No, but are you forgetting? You I, I wanted to make a mess of and Hannity and Combs. And you did, and you did. Like, the, I wanted to go on Hannity and Combs specifically to just lob grenades. Yeah, you did just that. It's just such a weird show. Out of all, I literally, if you knew the, the number of television shows that contact Dan to come on, I mean, it is everything from CNN to Fox News to, to I, I believe you were on the Oprah show once for Ricky Williams. I was, Actually, yes. you did Jim Rome, too. You did do a week's worth of the Jim Rome show, no? Yes, I did a week of Jim Rome's show. You look back on that week uh, <laughs> with fond memories? What was your final... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Chris Bosh is your favorite Heat player. He is. What's wrong with that? I, I don't understand this. Why? He's, I don't understand your logic. He's gentle. He's gentle and kind. The views expressed on the preceding program have been those of the host, guest, and callers, and do not necessarily reflect those of Lincoln Financial Media, its staff, advertisers, or agencies.